Kelly, you want to? Yeah. Okay, I see that it is six o'clock. And so I am going to call to order the regular meeting of the Chico Unified School District Board of Trustees. I would ask that uh, you pay attention to the whole the whole uh, meeting that we have here as there's gonna be a lot of useful information. So. Uh, please don't cut out on us midway. We have a lot of important things to cover. Um, I am going to report out that during our special board uh, meeting that we had uh, before this meeting in our closed session, the board provided legal direction on one existing litigation case, number 2020050662. With that, um, I would like us to stand for the flag salute. Please join us. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. The first announcement I want to make uh, because our next item up is announcements, is that if you'll notice, there are a few of the board members who do not have uh, facial coverings on right now. And uh, that is because we are distanced at least six feet apart. And we wanted to make sure that uh, what we were saying would be you know, understandable and that our expressions and uh, body language, whatever, could be observed as well. So um, anyhow, the vast majority of people who are here do have their face masks on and um, 
we appreciate that. Our first item of business then would be any announcements that board members have. Uh, do any members have announcements? Okay, I see none. Yes, Kelly, did you have? I'm sorry, Priscilla Burns was given a national award for um, her, oops, her, right. her um, uh, uh, the name Mandarin of the name. So Priscilla is a uh, CTE teacher at Pleasant yes. Valley High School and she recently received some national recognition. Uh, Priscilla does a fantastic job with her students and her program. And Eileen just wanted to make sure that she was recognized publicly for that award. Right. There, there were only 16 people recognized right. nationwide, and she was one of them. And we are grateful that she's teaching in Chico Unified. Yes. yes. Kudos to Priscilla. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next item that we have is, um, it's actually listed as items from the floor, but considering we do not have the ability to engage any people in items from the floor at this time. Um, we're gonna pass that one. Um, our next up is negotiations update, and that would be Jim Hanlon. Yes, thank you. So I just wanted to report that we have meet, been meeting throughout the summer with um, both CUTA and CSCA. We've had weekly meetings with CUTA leadership to discuss startup issues and other concerns and issues related to COVID-19 um, and staff. Um, we've had um, a number of meetings with CSCA. We are meeting tomorrow to discuss uh, um, an MOU for startup purposes also and reach agreement on that. Um, both conversations with both groups have been very positive, so I'd like to point that out. We've had a number of questions that have been submitted by both um, leadership groups, and um, we have responded to those um, in emails. We'll be posting all of those questions on our website uh, tomorrow. Um, on our staff um, staff page too. So for all the staff out there, those if you miss those emails, it'll, it will be posted in the staff room um, regarding specific issues to our employees. So that's it. Okay, thank you, Jim. All right, we will move on then to our consent calendar. Would any board members like to pull any items from the consent calendar? Okay, seeing none, I will entertain a motion. It's on Julie's side. Second. I move approval of the consent calendar. Second. All right, we have a motion by Linda Hovey, a second by Dr. Kaiser. Is there any further discussion needed? Okay, seeing none, we will take a roll call vote starting with Eileen Robinson. Aye. Griffin, aye. Kelly, aye. Lando, aye. All right, that is a unanimous approval of our consent calendar. Moving forward. We have uh, our business services, a discussion action item having to do with Charter Schools Measure K project requests. Okay, we'd like to bring up uh, Julie Kissel to lead this conversation. Kevin, Julie is attempting to, to um, get her audio working. Can you cover this one for her? Sure. So this is a request that we have from um, three of our charter schools that uh, we have Core Butte, Forest Ranch, and Sherwood Montessori. And this is fairly routine. These are dollars that are coming out of our bond that have been set aside for charters. And uh, in your agenda, you can see those items. If there's any questions, Kevin or Julie, Julie answer Gray. those. Um, I think I did have a question. Okay. Uh, if I can find it. With regards to the um, audiovisual equipment, the way that it was listed, it seemed to indicate that that was going to stay in that uh, 
site um, in the gym, or it was put in, it was put in there in such a way that it would be staying in there. Um, was that just a, the way it was phrased, or is this in fact something that can be moved out of there? I think that's just in the phrasing. Um, our expectation is that, again, any um, equipment that is purchased with bond dollars has the flexibility, in fact, to be moved. Okay, that's that's what I wanted to know. I know that is one of the uh, requirements. Uh, the other the other item had to do with Sherwood. Um, I was looking at the history of this, and um, I'm not sure if anyone who's here can comment on this, but it seems like, and this may be different relocatable classrooms, but there seems to be a lot of money being put into this one individual relocatable. And um, I just, I wondered, is that is that true? <laughs> What's going on there? Yes, I can answer that if you can hear me. Yes, Julie, we can, thank you. Oh, good, sorry about my AV issues there. Um, yes, because the city of Chico um, annexed the um, Chapman neighborhood, um, the Butte County Building Department has um, required that they do curb gutter sidewalk mm. improvements that wouldn't normally be part of the city. So there was quite a bit of confusion going back and forth between the permitting fees for the project and um, additional fees that were needed for the project to be completed because of that. Julie, the way it was written, it sounded like the city's annexation is what caused it, and you just said the county. So, Correct. The fees are being paid to the county, were paid to the county in anticipation that it was going to be annexed by the city. So what would normally have been required by Butte County was changed to what the city was going to require moving forward. So, yes, we did have to pay them to the city, I mean, to the county, but it was because of the city's requirements for street improvements, if that helps to clarify. Sorry, and those were uh, unanticipated expenses? Correct. They were unanticipated. Okay. Thank you for uh, explaining that. Okay. Any further questions with regards to these items? Uh, do I have a motion then? I move to approval of 8.1.1. I'll second. Okay, that was a motion by Dr. Kaiser, a second by Linda Hovey. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 That's a unanimous approval. Okay, moving on then to our next item, which is an educational services item, and it's the action regarding the request for declaration of obsolete materials. Correct, this is just the, um, not annual, but periodic update for our obsolete material list. Uh, this is something we've done annually, and as you can see, there are some, there are some items there. Are there any questions about those items? And those items are made available to other people, correct? Correct. And so if there's no takers, then that's, they go away. Yep. <laughs> okay, I just want to make that clear that that even if there's items that are on there that might be good items, if others do not find value in them or want them, then we give them away or we just dispose of them. Yes, our, our facilities folks, or warehouse folks have a process for that. Okay, that's great. Thank you, John. Okay, um, any further discussion on this? All right, do we have a motion on this? Okay, motion by Eileen Robinson, second by Dr. Kaiser. If there's no further discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And so that's a unanimous approval. Okay, moving on. A discussion action item with regards to resolution 1523-20, which is uh, certifying the approval of the governing board to enter into a transaction with the California Department of Education for the purpose of providing child care and development services and to authorize the designated personnel to sign contract documents for fiscal year 2021. Ted? 
this is our, ooh, excuse me, this is our yearly agreement with our state funded preschools and it's our way of verifying to the state that our school board is supportive of it and this is kind of the documentation we send in to them to show them that you're supportive and we want to continue that relationship with them. I wanted to make a comment. Yes. Oh, okay. I wanted to make a comment that I think uh, uh, they've been in the preschool for two weeks or three weeks. Since the sixth. Since the sixth. And these are kids that are three and four, and they're wearing masks every day, and they're listening to the teacher, and they're learning. So it's an incredible uh, positive, I believe, that we can provide that for uh, our parents and families. So with that, I move resolution 1523-20. I'll second that. Okay, um, a motion by Dr. Kaiser, a second by Eileen Robinson. Um, I would just like to ask too, Ted, Ted, do you have anything further you want to um, share about how that is going? Just talking with Kathleen Corbett, who directs them, she said they've done fabulous so far. Uh, I mean, all of the concerns about masks and sterilization and knock on wood, everything has gone very smoothly thus far. They're, they're capped at a lower number right now because of some state licensing kinds of things. So there are 10 in there versus 24 typically. But thus far, everything is off to a great start. But these are three and four-year-olds? Three year olds? and four-year-olds, yes. Okay. They're able to comply just like Dr. Kaiser shared with masks and kind of safety precautions and all those kinds of things. So, so far, often going well. Well, that bodes well. Thank you. Okay, um, then we will take a vote. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, that passes unanimously. All right, um, we will then move on now to our discussion action uh, item that has to do with a discussion regarding our return to school. And um, before we start this discussion, I would like to um, explain how this is going to work. Uh, this, the situation with the COVID virus is very fluid. It changes day to day, week to week. Since mid-March, the district has been focusing on issues related to COVID. This has involved surveying of families and staff, as well as keeping abreast of local contagion data and emerging information about COVID research and best practices. As is expected, when new information is received, people's responses often change. This is apparent in the response of our governor to COVID. When the number of active cases first began to grow, he issued a stay-at-home order. When it appeared that the danger was reduced, he gradually opened businesses. He referred to these as stages or phases in the spread of the virus, with his response to phase one being the most restrictive and his response to phase two being a bit less restrictive. Within the past week, in a response to COVID case increases, the governor took a step backward into phase two and closed down many establishments in counties that had previously been reopened in the state. Butte County was not among them as it is not currently on the watch list. The governor in making these judgments is relying on advice from health experts. His objective is to keep the virus from overwhelming the system and to provide an effective response to those affected. We are not health professionals. Therefore, when it comes to questions of safety, we must rely on the advice of others, the same as the governor. To that end, we are working with Butte County Public Health Public health officials and a Butte County-wide team of educators have formulated a COVID-19 schools guidance action plan with flow charts indicating steps to be taken relative to COVID exposure and testing. This is available for use by districts throughout the county and we plan to use it. That brings us to why we are here tonight. As educators, we know how significant it is to have in-person contact between students and teachers and students and their peers. The bond that is formed between students and teachers is what makes everything else possible. Student interaction, friendships, and socialization 
are also very important to healthy child development. We know how disruptive COVID has been to family life. People are craving some stability. School is slated to open in one month, so we must ask, can we provide safe means for our children to resume their education next month? We will contemplate three issues to help us decide. The first is, can we create a safe learning environment in our schools? Safe for students, safe for teachers, safe for the community. The second question we will ask is, in this rapidly changing COVID environment, can we be responsive whether circumstances improve or worsen? How do we recognize when change is needed? Can we be nimble? Thirdly, if it is feasible to have children back in school, which attendance option would work best? AM, PM sessions, alternating days, which would be least impacted if a change is needed? Finally, we will ask what type of professional development and support do we need to provide to our teachers so they can be prepared for any instructional changes that might be required, such as going from in-class instruction to independent study or the reverse. We want to be sure to implement a consistent quality curriculum and utilize it across the district to prevent learning gaps. We know there are many tangential issues to be addressed. However, time is of the essence tonight. We must begin with a skeleton of a plan that can then be fleshed out. We need to provide parents with the information they will need in order to make informed choices. We then need to deal with staffing and logistics. This cannot wait. So what I, I would ask you to please cooperate during this meeting so it runs smoothly. Please follow our meeting rules which are designed to keep the discussion focused and moving forward. If you wish to make a comment, please write it down. Staff will be providing information and then we'll ask the board to take action. But before any action is taken by the board, comments over Zoom will be heard. Each person's comments are limited to three minutes. Please try to avoid repeating the same comments made by others. The Zoom platform has a capability for participants to indicate support for a speaker's comments. Please use that if you wish to endorse another's view. In closing, let me just thank you for participating in this discussion and for those who took the time to send in comments. We board members, like you, are mightily struggling with this decision. Three of us will be sending kindergartners from our families to school this August. So this decision really hits home for us. Let's all work together to design a plan that is in the best interests of our students. Okay, with that, we'll open um, this up for information from the staff. Your mic. Pardon? John, I've heard you do this several times, so if you wouldn't mind just walking um, our board and the community through the meeting protocols and norms. Thank you, Superintendent Staley. So it's really important, as uh, Madam President indicated earlier, to keep this meeting running smoothly, that we ask everyone to mute yourself when not talking. Um, we have up on the screen now meeting protocols, but I know some of you are, call, are um, Zooming in from your phone. So it's important to raise your hand within Zoom if you can via your phone. And if you'd like to comment, uh, we'll, we'll be calling on people um, in order. And then we will lower your hand to allow the next person in the queue to be available for comment. We will be monitoring the chat, and we've been doing so already. This meeting is being recorded, as well as the chat. So later, um, we'll be able to provide both of those to the community.
So again, I would like to read the, uh, some additional meeting protocols just to be sure that people who are on, on their phones can hear them again. It's really important that we limit each speaker to three minutes. Um, please avoid, again, repetitive comments. If you agree with the statement, it's great for us to, to see that agreement by uh, clicking on thumbs up or the, the clapping your hands icon. Uh, we will present and review the elements of the res return to school plan. There will be opportunity after each review of segments of this presentation for public comment. We would, we would ask that you restrict your public comment specific to the element that has just been presented. So for example, if we are talking about safety guidelines, that you restrict your public comment to just safety guidelines, knowing that we'll get to the rest of the plan later in the meeting. Thank you, Mr. Shepard. So I'm gonna kick this off by just saying that a lot has changed in the last week since we had our last board meeting. We were together last Wednesday, and in that time, we've seen a lot of change. And certainly, there has been a lot of change since we sent out the surveys three and a half weeks ago now. So we are well aware that things are changing, and you know, right now, they are not in a pattern that are changing for the better for our state or our community. So when we began looking at this, we really said, we have to come up with a plan that is flexible and adaptable and nimble. And in looking at this, we found three segments that we needed to address. The first and uh, very important aspect is our health and safety protocols. And what we would like the board to do is to hear from Mr. Boltima on some of our physical plant health and safety protocols, Mr. Marchant on what we're doing with staff and students, and then seek approval from the board in support of those safety protocols. So we're gonna start off with safety guidelines, and then after that, we will move into the stages, how we will know where we need to be at any given time based on health information, and then um, ultimately move into discussions about what model would look best given any stage that we might be in. So let's start off with our safety guidelines, and uh, Mr. Boltima, I believe you have the first part of this one. Yeah, I just want to make sure that we, we, everybody understands we'll be discussing the stages later, but these safety guidelines that we're going over right now will cover all stages one through three. Okay, so Mr. Boltima. Sure. Um, so we're already planning and have installed hand sanitizer in every classroom. So that work has already been completed. Uh, hand sanitizer dispensers will be placed at entry points to all schools. We've already ordered 100 of those stands that we expect to be delivered before school starts. Um, we also are disinfecting uh, on a daily basis, and obviously that was one of the largest concerns. And one of the items that we're looking at, and actually we're testing right now, is a new cleaning um, uh, piece of equipment, which actually allows our custodians to preload an entire um, uh, series of classrooms in one setting. So they're not having to go back and forth all the time and kind of reloading their mop buckets. It uses a high fiber uh, material and it has different um, applicators actually. So we can use uh, a different higher applicant applicator for tabletops, which allows our custodians not to have to bend over but yet still quickly hit those areas. So we think this will be more efficient for staff. Um, we uh, will think it will provide better disinfecting qualities um, and each school will also have a dedicated um, washer dryer system for this specifically. Um, we will continue to evaluate our cleaning to make sure that we're meeting all the criteria, touching all areas. I, I will say our custodial staff has done an excellent job early in the summer getting our, our classrooms prepared. They really did deep cleaning um, and getting to areas that we haven't in many, many years. Uh, schools uh, will be working to limit uh, the sharing of supplies, which means we'll have to provide additional supply money and budgets to get that work done. Uh, but we're working with Ed Services to have those conversations. And then one of the other key issues is indoor air quality. And um, it is already a law that we provide a certain amount of fresh air into every classroom and office and open space. Uh, all of our heating, ventilation, and air conditioning units, we call those HVAC, all of our HVAC units are calibrated to meet that legal requirement. Uh, beyond that, um, we do replace air filters quarterly right now, and we have a, man, uh, a work order system upgrade that if you remember we talked about last year, all that data will be maintained in that work order system. So at any point in time, we can actually provide 
whomever a detailed list of the work that was done, including air filter replacement on every HVAC unit. Uh, we are also upgrading the rating of the filters we are going to be using. So our historical practice has been use a what they call a MERV 10 rated um, filter. We are now purchasing MERV 13s. Frankly, anything beyond a MERV 13 would restrict the airflow to a point that uh, would not be effective. So we really are at that highest point um, with fil filters that we'll be able to meet. There'll be some challenges with this. Uh, we've had some conversations with teachers and, and with the union of maybe some better communication of when filters have been replaced. And so we're talking about how do we do that very easily with stickers, maybe some dates on systems so that our teachers are informed of when that work has been done. So that is just kind of a, a very summary view of our view of making sure that our classrooms are, are safe and clean for our kids. Thank you, Mr. Baltima. The second guideline I'll be going over is the per personal protective equipment, the PPEs. We've been receiving a lot of emails regarding this, and I will be going over our guidelines. Chico Unified will require protective facial coverings for staff and students. The students will include cloth, disposable facial coverings, and face shields for all of them. This also includes cloth and disposable face coverings and facial shields, facial shields for our staff. Food handlers and healthcare staff will wear all required personal protective equipment. So we will be asking for our staff and our students to be wearing facial coverings during the school day. And I just want to reiterate there, because this has been a topic on which we've received a lot of communication. Uh, we heard last week when we met with Butte County Public Health that it is their understanding and, and their stance that facial coverings are re required in public when you cannot maintain social distancing right now. And uh, it certainly has been made clear by our governor and the state department as well. So um, at this stage, we have no options. We have to do this. But going beyond that, um, as Jay mentioned, as we're getting into stages one through three, we believe to keep our teachers and our staff safe that facial coverings will be required and we will be working to provide those that work best for each individual, whether that is the disposable, the, the cloth, or as I'm wearing tonight, the uh, shield. Okay, I, I just would, ooh. Sorry. sorry. Oh, sorry, I would just like to reiterate again uh, it is the county health authorities who set the standards, and it's our job uh, in taking care of our students and our staff to follow them. So um, this is something that is an expectation, period. May I just clarify with you, Mr. Marchand or Kelly, that we will be providing the um, face coverings for the students and staff? So far, we have acquired 1,000 face shields to make sure, sure that all of our staff, teachers, office staff have them available. We have ordered already 50,000 that we have in of the disposable masks. So on hand, we will have them available for students and staff that forget their facial shield. We will obviously ask families if they have their own to use them, but we will have them um, on our campuses for people that do not have one. Excellent, thank you. Okay, and um, Kelly, if I understood, uh, there was going to be, for circumstances that were very um, unique, say, to teachers, um, there was a set aside to deal with uh, potential uh, unique circumstances? Yeah, I, I believe Mr. Marchand is going to get to that. Okay. But it is definitely our intention. We know there will be unique situations that come up um, as individuals are unique. And so we are going to budget a set aside so that we can have dollars available to purchase items that are unique to individual needs. And you know, an example would be, uh, there may be somebody that because of what they're teaching, they need to hand out um, lots of material. So they may want to be utilizing um, gloves. We would make sure we would purchase, that, purchase those. There may be a situation where um, you know, speech therapists might be in close contact working with students working on enunciation and might want to have a protective layer of plexiglass between them and the student in addition um, to a facial shield. So that set aside would allow us to fund 
some items, some safety items. Another example will be on our offices. We'll most likely have plexiglass put up too because that will be a high volume of families coming into our offices. So we're right now looking at that too and how we can put those in all of our offices. Okay, the third guideline under um, safety is health screening. Signage will be in place to remind the school community to not to enter if they're experiencing any symptoms of illness. We will be doing daily wellness checks to be administered before the students enter school, such as temperature checks. Families are recommended to, to take temperatures of their students be daily before school. Anyone with a fever of 100.4 degrees or higher may not go to a school site. Students and adults should also screen themselves for respiratory symptoms such as cough and shortness of breath prior to coming to school each day. Students and adults experiencing these symptoms should not come to school. We have also per purchased uh, thermometers so we could have all the want thermometers for every one of our classrooms if a teacher feels that they want to take a temperature on a student that they may. Jay, could I add? So, um, as everybody in terms of the administration knows, I had to have surgery and I had to go two weeks of constantly monitoring my symptoms prior to being able to even go to the hospital. So I can say these are very quick, they're very simple, and there's no touch. So a fever reading is just seconds and it's literally no touch. So um, I think some people thought that they were having something put in their mouth and that is not the case. Thank you, Dr. Kaiser. Yes, I was lucky enough to get away from the coast um, this past weekend and two of the shops that I went into did temperature screens before I walked in, so yeah. Okay, the fourth and final one will, on your guidelines for safety is social distancing. Social distancing signage will be put in place. Physical barriers will be installed and in, as determined by administration in high traffic areas on campus where social distancing is not possible such as front offices and cafeterias. Classroom furniture slash equipment will be arranged for social distancing to the greatest extent possible. Are we anticipating that food will be packaged or how are we doing that? Yes, we're going in planning on sack lunches to start the year. Okay, okay so at this point, um, we would like to have a discussion about um, how the board is, uh, how the board feels about these uh, safety protocols and um, voting on whether this is, is, is something we will be voting on whether this is going to be uh, a set that we are going to adopt. And um, so we can have a discussion and we can also then take on um, Ted, do we have a number of people in the audience who? So at this moment, Madam President, there's two folks that have their hands raised and are waiting to comment. Okay, so would Three. the board like to hear people's comments first and then discuss? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. let's do it that way. So if you'd like to have the first person. So, I can't, I'm not a host apparently. So if we could have Christina Miller, uh, we will, I will unmute you and you will have three minutes to speak. We will give you a 30 second warning when your three minutes is almost up. Christina Miller. Hmm. It says talking up there, talking. What's going on? Christina, I'm going to see if I can unmute you from my end. Just hang with me for a second. Okay, Christina, you are, your microphone is unmuted. Okay, thank you. It would, it would not let me unmute myself. Okay. <laughs> so, I, I am the mom of a kindergartner. And I just like to say that, you know, as has already been presented, when the survey went out, it was a vastly different COVID situation than what we are experiencing right now in Butte County. 
And specifically Chico, if you look at the numbers, Chico is more heavily impacted than the rest of the county as well. So due to the number one, recent surge in cases, number two, the fact that the majority of the cases are within the ages of parents, these ages would then infect their children and spread through the school system. Third, the time it takes to get test results right now is upward of two weeks. I am a first responder and my most recent test result took 12 days to get back. That does not allow contact tracing to be effective within the school system. Not only that, it's taking longer and longer to make an appointment to get tested so that if you are symptomatic and not being hospitalized, it can take you up to five days to even get tested, let alone receive your results. For this reason, I strongly encourage the district to spend the time wisely until the school should start and adapting to a distance learning model, just like many other school districts are doing statewide as a result. This continuance of wishful thinking that we can safely return kids to school is simply that, wishful thinking. The most flexible plan that protects our children is distance learning at this time. Otherwise, we are gonna find ourselves in chaos at the last minute, trying to implement an effective distance learning program once again, just like we tried to do this spring. So with that, I do have a couple of other questions that weren't answered previously. Okay, we have 30 seconds for you, Christina. Okay, it'll be quick. Do the units recirculate air? If so, they're spreading that air all throughout the classrooms. And then I also wanted to know whether temperature checks are gonna be mandatory or voluntary. Thank you. Okay, now should, um, in response to this, should we provide some information for clarification? How do you feel about that? Okay, uh, well. That's up to the will of the board. We can certainly um, provide responses that we have. I will tell you that um, you know, at this particular time, without knowing which models we will be looking at, we won't have very specific responses. Okay, this is the yeah, the mandatory. Um, we we believe that the temperature checks would be mandatory. That is an answer to to that question. And um, with regards to the other the other issues that were brought up, um, nothing has been decided yet as far as. Uh, if there is a model of return to in-classroom instruction. So these safety precautions are what are just being proposed to see if there is a way that if we did provide that, that it would be possible. Yes, Eileen? Yeah, I just wanted to be after you finished, Madam President, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Sure. Um, I, I did have, um, uh, a point from what Mr. Baltima presented in the way of the specifications that our HVAC um, units uh, provide um, the air quality that the state mandates. So that's that's one issue. Um, the other is I, I agree with you that until um, uh, we decide on what uh, format we're going to use to try and reopen. Um, this speaker's questions would be uh, appropriately answered then. I do have one, one question um, regarding this part that we're considering, which is the health and safety precautions that we make before, um, that we agree to, to, to put in place as school starts. And one is the, um, how do we anticipate getting um, a thorough, um, exposure to the information to our parents before school starts? What's, what's the communication tool that we're going to use to let everybody know that, for example, there's one point of entrance, there's social distancing in line, that temperature checks will be made, and that checklist of 
how does your child feel before heading off to school? Right. That's gonna be information we're going to put, push out in multiple ways. We will send information home to parents. We need to send information home uh, in student-friendly language so that students are aware. We need to utilize social media. And uh, we are even considering a sign-off where here is what you're agreeing to um, if you are coming to school. You're participating in educational activities so that it is very clear. Okay, so we will um, move on to speaker two. Um, and, and I would like to just clarify, at this particular point, what we are talking about, because we have not gotten yet to the stages or the models, at this particular point, we're talking about the health and safety protocols that we have in place. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So just to remind the viewers out there who have raised your hand, if your question has been answered, or ideally if your comment has already been um, spoken, if you could lower your hand on your own, that would help us so other, other speakers can present to us. The next speaker here is Ruth Testhart, and the Brown family is on deck. Ruth, I'm going to unmute you, and we'll be ready for you. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, so my question was about the face mask. In an email from Jim Hanlon, it said that um, some students, um, they're thinking about special education students who could struggle wearing um, those safety equipment. So some students may be excused to, from wearing a mask due to their disability or medical reasons. I just wanted to bring this email up and see if anyone had thought about that, that the students who are not willing and who are, are not able to do those safety protocols, um, what the plan is for them, and also um, transportation, the safety uh, protocols for transportation, if that has been thought about and what are the plans. Okay. So I think that we are well aware that our special needs students, especially our students with severe special needs, um, will pose a challenge. And uh, those are things that we are continuing to talk about, that we are working with state guidance as well as um, local agencies. So I don't know that we can address those specifically because we will be following the student's IEP, the Individualized Education Plan, and working with parents and staff to ensure the safest environment possible. But those will be uh, driven by those individual needs. In terms of transportation, we have had many conversations, and Mr. Bultima um, is overseas transportation and can speak to that. Uh, we're really working through what those protocols might be. But obviously, the number of students that we can get on a bus safely is going to be severely limited. So um, there's more to come on transportation. I don't have the specifics yet, but based on the decision of the board tonight, we'll immediately go to work to figure out how um, we can do that work. There is a chance we will have reduced transportation as a result of the limitations? Yeah, I think the challenge is not only the, the spacing, but frankly, the availability of our drivers. And um, I think what, uh, as Kelly mentioned, special ed has an IEP. We're going to be legally required to provide that transportation along with our homeless students. My concern is how many drivers do we have beyond that to even do home to school? So we're going to be analyzing this and bringing back to the board on um, August 5th, really a recommendation to deal with transportation. But uh, to prepare you, it will probably look, um, look to a reduced home to school program because I just don't believe we're going to have the drivers to provide the same level of service we've done in the past. Okay, we, the, next, the next speaker is the Brown family. I will unmute you and I will lower your hand. And on deck is Matt Tennis. Thank you. My comment is about um, requiring students to wear masks all day. I have um, two different children and wearing a mask in a grocery store for 30 minutes. They're pulling at it, they're pulling it off. The store workers have theirs pulled down with their noses hanging out. Um, I don't see how you can require, especially small children, I also work in a school, um, small children to have masks on all day long. Um, social distancing in a classroom is not possible at all, not possible, unless you require like a small amount of children in each classroom. Um, but Christina said we're at an all-time high for, for cases. I don't see how we could be sending kids back right now. Just the fact that we're meeting right now on Zoom because it's not safe. Why would we send our children back if it's not safe? It doesn't even make sense. Uh, we need to focus on distant 
learning. The distant learning that was provided from multiple schools was crap, and it was different all over the district. Um, my kid is behind because of the distant learning that was provided. So if you take the month and spend it on the focus on distant learning and getting the curriculum strong there. Um, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Matt Tennis. Matt, I will unmute you and lower your hand. Hi there. Uh, thank you once again, um, Board of Trustees, for allowing me to have an opportunity to speak uh, on a matter that's passionate to me, that I'm passionate about. Uh, fundamentally, I think that it's very important that the kids in Chico go to school. Really, really important. So important, in fact, that it's on the same level as uh, the Postal Service, um, the kids whose parents work at grocery stores, just think about all the people who we rely upon every single day who are right now having to deal with quarterbacking their own kids' education and the burden that that is for them, okay? It's a big, big deal. Um, basically, we need to have our kids in school. There are also a lot of disadvantaged kids who they have two working parents in many cases, and they are, and let's just be realistic, they're gonna be stuck at home while their parents are off uh, putting food on the table and so on and so forth. Um, we need to have a place for those kids to go. Um, it's more than just childcare, it's an education. And right now they need it absolutely more than ever. What? In person. Um, and in person is important. We can't just put them in front of a TV screen and expect that they're gonna get what they need. Um, they won't pay attention. So uh, I have four children. thank you very much. I have uh, four children total and three in the school district. And so this is very, very important to me. So thank you so much for um, doing whatever you possibly can to put our kids back in school. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Matt. Again, if your comment has already been um, communicated to the board, you could lower your hand to keep us moving through. The next speaker is Elizabeth Stevens with Stephanie Baldivia on deck. Elizabeth, I will lower, I will unmute you and lower your hand. Hi, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, I think my biggest concern, and I, and I think that this echoes what someone else um, commented on in the chat is that, um, Look at your chat. We, we know that the majority of, people are most contagious before they show any symptoms at all. So yeah, we're taking temperatures, that's great, and doing all these preventative measures, but um, I, I, that really worries me, and I would like to know what the board thinks about that. Okay, thank you. Our next speaker is Stephanie Baldivia with JC Merritt Cudney on deck. Stephanie, I am unmuting you, and I will lower your hand. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Uh, there were details shared in this last section about cleaning and safety, and I appreciate the monitoring of temperatures as an idea. There was a question in the chat of who will be taking temperatures, and I was hoping that you could address that. Um, thank you also to Christina. Regarding sanitation or sanitizing, um, I would like to hear about library materials. I'm a librarian, and the library is a big part of my daughter's joy at school. So I want to know, will libraries be open and what is the plan for sanitizing or quarantining books or if that has been considered? Thank you. Thanks, JC. And our next speaker is Lindsay Pratt. Lindsay, I am unmuting you. I'm sorry, JC, I'm going to come back to you. Uh, if I am unmuting Lindsay and JC, I will come back to you. It's not letting me unmute her. Okay, we are having problems unmuting Lindsay. So JC, we are coming back to you. And JC, I'm going to unmute you. And you, are, you have a open mic. Hello, I'm um, speaking as both a teacher and a parent in the district, 
And you might be addressing this later in the presentation, but since safety was now, I'm wondering if um, the safety protocols for COVID exposures are going to be addressed later on um, and the close contacts. Thank you, JC. And Lindsay, you are now, uh, your microphone is now available. Thank you. Yes, thank you for taking my question. My husband and I are wondering, what is the plan if and when a student or teacher tests positive? As there are so many people in contact daily, how do you plan on controlling that? Are we going to quarantine the whole class? Um, will just that one section be asked to stay home? Will they close the school for two weeks? What is your plan in case someone tests positive, I guess is my question. That, that's a great question, and we will cover that later in the presentation. Okay. okay, thank you. Okay, that is the end of our raised hands, Madam President. Okay, uh, thank you. As far as uh, speaking to the issues that were brought up, um, I think it is important to discuss, uh, because it is well known now, that people do not show symptoms. They may have this, and they may be transmitting two days before there's any you know, indication they really have it. And so um, that does pose a little bit of a problem because if there's no way of knowing we've got people who are coming to school that have this and we have no way of knowing they have it and are, could possibly spread it. So I think that is one of the major issues with regards to safety because the um, the, the uh, safety protocols put in place, as far as I can see, and anybody correct me if I'm wrong, um, that doesn't cover them. Yeah, Eileen? Yes, thank you. Um, my information is uh, remembering what the uh, personnel from the Butte County Department of Health gave us last Wednesday, and the determination of what happens when somebody tests positive, the tracking and tracing um, issues surrounding that, that's their department. They have authority to, to do that. Um, I, I thought that one of the things that we've discussed um, without you know, conclusion was what do you do about the asymptomatic and if you don't know, you don't know, and you can't require testing. So it's, um, it's an issue, unsolved at this point, in my opinion. <laughs> yes, Kathy. So uh, again, uh, the county health authorities uh, will have the actual protocols, and they will set them. But the aspects of the temperature check, the mask, the cleaning, and the fact that all of our data suggests you have to be within six feet for more than 15 minutes uh, for a contagion effect to take place. Internationally, the data is very strong that children are less contagious than adults. So uh, there is no perfect world with this. Um, and you know, people would like to have perfect answers, but uh, again, we're gonna have to follow our health authorities' advice. Um, and so I think really the question is, to me with this, have we in our laying out of the safety guidelines covered all the things that are known and that we can be responsible for? And I feel like we have. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's what we need to go back to. Um, you ever had a mouse in your house? I have. They're sneaky, but it doesn't mean that everybody runs around and nails all their doors and windows shut. So the context for this is, I think we react effectively uh, when we see evidence that there's something that might be a mouse, um, but we can't go uh, you know, so far over that everybody there feels unsafe. So um, again, I support these guidelines. Thank you. Okay, yes, Tom. Well, I do think that for the most part, our protocols are good and some interesting questions were raised. Um, I think it's a little facile to compare a virus to a mouse in your house. I think 
that's a bad analogy to the point of not being particularly useful. Um, the virus is more dangerous than a mouse and much harder to detect. Um, admittedly, there are things we're not gonna be able to control, but I don't want anyone to think that we are downplaying or minimizing uh, real risks in this case. Okay. Uh, Linda, do you have anything you wanted to say? I actually agree with Kathy. I know that our district staff has spent countless hours uh, reviewing this, taking taking a look at staff and student logistics. The, they've worked tirelessly to keep up on those ever-changing recommendations from the state and the local health experts. Um, you know, we're implementing the widespread sanitation and hygiene measures. We've purchased an extensive, extensive variety of PPE and equipment. Um, we're going to continue to monitor and change protocols as we need to to best ensure the safety of our staff and our students. So, you know, the asymptomatic ones, that is not something that is in our control at this point in time. But I, as Dr. Kaiser was saying, with the precautions we have in place, you know, I think that's the best step forward. Well, I think, I think with the, um, the fact that, you know, this is, as I mentioned, as everyone knows, an ever-changing. Yes. More information is coming out. More studies are being done. Uh, more um, research is being done. And all we can do is, is stay up on it and keep trying to use best practices as they are revealed. And um, so, you know, this is just a right now, this period in time, and as we move forward, things are going to be changing and things are going to be better. So we just have to do the very best. Mm -hmm. If we, we, if we uh, abandon everything, and that seems to be what some districts are doing, just saying, well, we're not even gonna deal with it, then of course that defeats uh, the <clears throat> objectives of Absolutely. what Mr. Mr. Tennis brought forth, which mm -hmm. was, you know, there are people who absolutely feel, um, you know, I want to get my kids back in school. I recognize the risks. Um, I see what you're doing, and I believe it is adequate, and um, I don't want to risk the other alternative, which is my child not getting the education, and there's a certain amount of risks with, with that whole thing, too, um, exactly. with the online learning. But we, one thing to remember, too, with all of the callers who do call in is that we are always offering um, independent study. Yes. So people who are concerned about their child being in, and we haven't even decided that this is going to happen yet, but if we were to decide that school is going to take place on our uh, sites in, in some form or another, um, there will always be the opportunity for parents to opt out of that and to do independent study. And somebody did bring up that um, they're, you know, they were unhappy with what happened back in mm -hmm. March. Well, what happened in March was not something that anybody could predict, and it was not anything that could be prepared for. And yes, things, this was not the best. Uh, teachers made a great effort to make that work and uh, have that be a, a valuable learning experience, but the way it all came down, it was very difficult to make that happen. Regardless of where things go, our teachers are being trained and will be trained in the, uh, the model that and the programs that are being utilized for independent study, and it will be consistent, and it will be across the district. And so that should not be uh, used as an excuse to say, well, you know, I don't want to participate in this, or you guys should be spending your time on this. That has already been contemplated and is being mm -hmm. dealt with. Mm -hmm. So um, anyhow, what we're going to do is we're going to decide, and Kelly, if you wanted to mention something, and if this is the appropriate time, well, I just wanted to say, in the uh, health care protocols and the safety protocols that we're bringing forward, these would apply to, regardless of what the model is. So if we are in uh, an online learning model, but students are returning to school uh, for some intensive help in, say, reading or a particular area, this would apply. If um, 
we were in an in-person environment. This is what we would expect to happen. Um, so it is in all of our models. And in addition, um, the temperature checks, that question was asked, who would do that? We do expect staff to do that. Uh, the question was also asked about libraries. And very honestly, we have not thought about, that, about libraries yet. Will libraries be open? Um, you know, that is just not someplace we've gotten to yet. So just to be honest, you know, there, those things will continue to come up as we work through this. But we have to have a starting point. And I also want to say that as um, best practices in health and safety come forward, we will implement those. If you remember when this started and we, you know, we closed school back in March, masks were suggested do not wear them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in fact, they were discouraged so that they would be available for medical personnel. So as things change, um, as I said earlier, we have to be flexible and adaptable as things change. Mm -hmm. And yes, in reminding them that this is a, a universal protocols that will be implemented. So it's not something that's going to go away unless we get into stage, what is it, four, where it's declared back to normal. And even then, maybe some people are going to still feel it's necessary. Yes. So yeah, mm -hmm. yes. Um, I'd like to just make a comment before we actually start looking at our instructional models. Um, there have been some fairly critical uh, assertions that teachers in that two-month cycle where we were thrown into an emergency framework weren't really working. They were just goofing off, et cetera. I uh, have been a professional educator for 45 years, uh, and I have taught interns all over the state online. I've taught in prisons. I taught on the Maritime Academy ship. So the framing of how online instruction goes varies dramatically with the equipment and the background and what it is, the content of the course. It can be done effectively, but the age of the child and the need to know their teacher is really, really a critical aspect. I'm one of those board members who has a kindergartner starting this fall. And um, you can't even get him to do, you know, FaceTime where he's holding still. He's dancing, he's singing, <laughs> he's playing with the cat. So it's one of these things where I think that uh, any kind of instructional model that we come to on as a decision for now, um, Every child will be a little bit different, and every teacher will do their very best to have education happen effectively in the model that they are in. Okay, Eileen, did you have a comment? Um, yes, just, just briefly. I just wanted to relate to uh, the people that have both spoken and um, written emails to us that uh, one of the things that was a topic quite often was fear fear of what would happen, fear of, um, uh, well, just, you get my, what I mean. One of the things that I finally came to understand was that um, fear was very necessary. If we're going to stay alert and pay attention to what we need to pay attention to, to do the best we can to stay within the recommended guidelines as they change, we do need to have some fear but it's a healthy kind of fear. It's like you know, teaching your child to look both ways before you cross the street. That's a fear response, fear of them getting hit by a car. So fear is something we do need to pay attention to, but not have it be debilitating. Okay, so um, what I'd like to know is, is the board ready to vote on acceptance of the safety protocols at this point? Okay, uh, these are strictly with regards to the safety protocols. Yes. So I can ask that anyone who has their hand raised um, that has already had their comment uh, been um, 
delivered to the board, please lower your hand. And if this isn't about the safety guidelines, if we are going to be working on the models next. Please lower your hand. Madam President, would you like to move? We have five now. Four. Four. Okay. Um, I can see that we're going to have to develop some more processes for this, but um, okay, let's let's go forward with this, and then the next time I would like a discussion among the board as to how you want to proceed with regards to the number or the amount of time that Thank we're you. going to spend Ma with this. <clears throat> Madam President, I, I could suggest that the people who have their hand raised can add their comments to the chat, and if what they add to the chat has not been presented, we can read that out. Okay, that'd be good. That's okay. That would be great. A wonderful suggestion. If uh, if you can do that, I I'm not aware of how these this system works. So if that is possible, that sounds like a reasonable solution. I have done Zoom Senate um, Zoom quite a bit, so the chat can go directly to John, or it can be shared with the whole group, and then that would be an effective way to see if there's something unique there. Okay. So will John is that? True that, then you will monitor that to see if something unique pops up? Yes, I am monitoring that right now. And again, I will only repeat it if it hasn't already been presented. Okay. So, um, so if we could have anyone with their hand raised, please lower your hand, enter your comment into the chat. Yes, Tom. Tom? So while he's monitoring the chat, should we set a number of speakers for the next section ahead of time? Yes, um, I think we should. Um, so, if, so if we were to have, for example, they get three minutes, 10 speakers, that's a half hour. Mm -hmm. And so I think we have to be watching ourselves that we don't have so much time taken up that then uh, perhaps the board itself isn't, you know, spending as much time as we might need to. So right now it's seven o'clock. Um, we're supposed to go until nine. So could I suggest perhaps that we say five speakers uh, at three minutes? And I would suggest that if a speaker is number six or seven, they go immediately to the chat so that they know that they have a chance to at least incorporate their comments. Thank okay, you. how do other board members feel about that? Okay, it sounds like we're in agreement on that. So we will have uh, five speakers and then uh, the other, any people who otherwise would want to contribute, they will do that through the chat. And then John will be monitoring to see if any unique comments Correct. come yes. up or issues. Yes. And the chat, chat transcript will be available? Correct. Uh, very good, thank you. Okay, so that way we will get all the comments and information. Thank you for clarifying that, Tom. Yes, and, um, and uh, okay, so at this point, um, was there anything that you wanted to share, John? No. Okay. The, all the comments that have come in since we made that decision have been comments about previous comments and our um, repetitions of things that have already been said. Okay. Okay, fine. Okay, great. Then what I will do is I'm going to request that we take a vote on approval of the safety protocols as they have been presented tonight with the understanding that as uh, the COVID situation, you know, continues to evolve, things will be updated and uh, addressed with, you know, best practices according to what public health experts and our public health department in particular recommend. Yes, Eileen. I'll move approval of your motion, Madam President. Okay, okay. Um, Eileen Robinson has uh, moved approval of the protocols, uh, seconded by Dr. Kaiser. Any further discussion, comments by the board? All right, we will uh, take a vote then. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, those have been approved, and those would be uni universal protocols that would be instituted um, across the board. All right, now I'm a little confused because I thought the next thing we were going to cover was going to deal with more about whether 
we are okay having to do with uh, how we will be responsive to changing circumstances be they a worsening of the covid picture in our county or improvement you are absolutely correct so one of the challenges that we faced is we didn't want this to be um, emotional decisions that we are making we realized that the covid environment is changing and is changing daily hourly and so we wanted to be able to come up with a way that we could be flexible and adaptable to wherever we are within the stages of reopening. So what we looked at is uh, the update on California's pandemic roadmap. And we looked at the stages that are in there for the state and counties to reopen. And they have four different stages. And um, if we can move on to that, the stages. Switch the slide here. Next slide. There you go. So stage one is where we were in the spring, and that was when the governor decreed the stay-at-home order. Everything was locked down. You only had uh, the essential workforce that was coming to work. Those were your healthcare workers. Those were educators. Educators are deemed essential workers. And um, grocery production, the things that it kept to keep society running. So um, in stage two, is, and this is straight from the document, were lower risk workplaces, and that was the recommendation at that point that in stage two, we can look at modified school programs and childcare reopening with safety measures, measures in place. So, you know, definitely social distancing, um, personal protective equipment. On stage three is when you get into higher risk reopening in stage three, you see in-person dining, you see salons, you see higher risk businesses that are able to open. And in stage four, we are at the end of the stay at home. Things return to the new normal. Uh, I'm sure they will never be exactly the same. So what we wanted to do is tie our stages to the stages of reopening. California um, has not yet been past stage, stage two. Butte County wrote a proposal to move into what they called a stage 2B, which did allow them, they were given approval, and they were allowed to open uh, in, in restaurant dining, uh, bars were able to open, gyms, salons were able to open, but now that cases have changed, we're already seeing a pulling back of that. So when we look at that, we realize we need to be able to adjust with those changes as well. And we need to do it based on um, healthcare professionals' advice. So uh, this Butte County Health, Butte County Public Health, is uh, doing their stages where we are. They were the ones that applied for us to be able to move into that stage 2B. Um, as we move backward, that I think will also be indicative. So. We looked at the models that we have, and if you look at stage one, that would be strictly online learning like we were in the fall. Um, and I don't mean like we were in the fall in terms of the instruction that we delivered, but it would be students would be at home and uh, teachers would be in the workplace, but delivering from the workplace. In uh, stage two, we would need to look at a modified traditional schedule so that we could implement all of the safety measures, including the social distancing. And in order to do that, we would need to have our student classes cut in half. So uh, we would need to figure out a way that only half of the students were present at any time so that we could do, truly do the social distancing. Who's making the marks? That, those are good. That's, I mean, that's oh. when people are able to put their thumbs up or put oh, things on oh, there, I think. You. So uh, as we move into stage three, stage three would be where, okay, everything is starting to reopen. You still have to have safety measures in place. You would still have masks. Um, but at this point, this is when your bars, your restaurants, your things were really starting to get back into the reopening. And at this point, we could move back into a um, traditional school setting with safety measures in place. And then when you get into stage four, now we're starting to get back into the models that we had prior to the school closures for COVID. So- Ms. Superintendent Staley, can I interrupt for just a second? You absolutely so we, may. So we have someone who is um, adding reactions to, this, to the screens 
And we would appreciate if you would stop doing that. Uh, we need yes. to be sure that people can read all the information provided on the slides. Or we're just going to have to refer to the um, only slide deck for the board. We do know that, that we have over 200 people who are viewing the slide presentation, and we'd really support if we could see everything clearly. Thank you. Yes. And recognize that we have an audience of varying viewpoints. So uh, we need to have the opportunity not to have that hijacked. So thank you for that. So that was um, our thought in trying to align stages that are made based on health data. We are not healthcare professionals. We need to be able to uh, base decisions based on where the um, society, where our county and where the state is moving. So with that, um, I turn it over to Mr. Shepard and uh, Mr. Sullivan if they have any more comments about the different stages. So, Madam President, right now there's two people that have their hands raised. Okay, um, let us let us hear the first uh, person who would like to speak. Okay, Melina Watts, your hand is raised. I will unmute you and lower your hand. Yeah, I'm attempting to unmute her, and it's not. And I, I do want to reiterate that these comments should be with regards to this issue of our, uh, you know, gearing. Can you hear we me now? Yes, we can. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you for being inclusive. I appreciate it. I have some logistical questions. Are the hours per day going to be reduced? Less time together is, uh, is better in terms of potential transmission of disease? Okay. Uh, excuse me, but I have to stop you right here. Um, yes. What we're doing, and I don't, I don't know if, if perhaps you, you weren't uh, tuned in at the very beginning, but um, we established certain um, operating rules, and what we're doing at this point is we are, we are directing our, our comments only to the segment that we're discussing at this time. Right now, what we're discussing is um, the res our being responsive to the stages that the governor has outlined. Correct. So as, as far as specifics I, go with regards to any of the models, that will be coming up next when we discuss the models and, and the proposals for the different, the different options. Thank you. Yes, what we're looking at now is, uh, does this make sense for us to be tying um, educational models where we are as an educational institution to the reopening of the county and the state. Okay, we have one speaker, Christina Miller. Christina, I'm going to unmute you and lower your hand. I'm attempting to unmute you. It's okay, Christina, your microphone is open. Hi, thank you. I, I, I guess I'm not exactly sure what you are discussing at this moment, so I don't know if my comments are appropriate, but I don't completely understand how the school district, primarily for the younger grades, thinks that they're going to be able to effectively social distance the kids. Okay, we're not... At this moment, okay, I, I don't know, Christine, I thought you were here from the beginning, but perhaps not. I was, I'm not understanding. And there's been a lot of Brown Act um, comments that have not been read into the record that were not uh, similar to similar comments previously. I just wanted to make that aware as well. Uh, not, I don't think you're, anyhow. Okay. Um, <laughs> With regards to how we're handling this is we've divided this into different segments of issues that we have to uh, to evaluate. One of the things is how are we going to be responsive to changes that occur in the COVID landscape over time? And so what, what uh, the superintendent has brought forth is that what we're going to be doing is we're going to be relying on the health professionals, public health professionals, 
and uh, which also the governor is also relying on public health professionals in determining which, which stage uh, we are in. And that's, that's why right now we are exhibiting on the screen the different stages. And right now we are in a stage 2B where we have certain restrictions uh, with regards to different types of industries and contacts that we can make. And uh, so what we're going to be doing in the future is get our instruction basically from public health with regards to how restrictive we need to be, what changes we might need to make in to be uh, in accordance with the stage that they are requiring. Yeah, Kat, uh, Kathy, Dr. Kaiser. I think that, and I, I'm not at all surprised. I think part of the difficulty is that what is in front of us is extremely pared down uh, framework. It's not about discussing what you think it would look like when you're in stage two. So just as an illustration, so spring break was going on. I was on the coast with my family and we were driving back when the governor said stay at home. Obviously, we had to keep driving. Um, but you had most of the way coming back construction workers working. Not because they were defying the governor, but because they had already been identified as essential. So the point that's being presented here is we will be faced with orders. Some will be as direct as the governor, some will be direct from the health departments. The logic to us is we should have the ability to move between those directions as a school district by understanding what might happen. So when stage one happened, nobody was prepared for that to happen. It was very sudden. This time around, we're going to know one, two, three, and four. And the logic that's being presented on the screen is should not we have the ability to respond in the school district to each of those potential stages? And I think to add to that, Kathy, uh, we don't actually know what stage we will be in on August 17th we when that exactly. date rolls around. And we don't know what stage we will be in on October 30th. Nope. So we need something that allows us to be flexible and nimble that if indeed we get put back into a stage one and we have stay at home orders, then that's where we will go as an educational organization. If things get miraculously better, which I hope they do, um, then we can start looking in at stage three. But right now where things stand, you know, would be the stage two. But, right. but what we wanted to do is not say, um, here's where we're gonna be and we're gonna be there forever. We know things are gonna change and we need to have that some kind of indicator that tells us it's changing and you need to change with it. And let me just make a comment in general. Um, our One of our main jobs as a school board is to set the direction of the district. And that is what we're attempting to do here is to get some clarity on how to move forward during this COVID you know, situation. And so we need to have a plan, and then we need to flesh out the plan. And so this is what we're doing is we're, we're just initially going step by step and setting things up. So if we agree that this is a good way to gauge where we're at and, and uh, where we are, say, on the spectrum, and that this has been dictated by reliable sources, professional health sources, then that's a good system to use. So that's what we're asking is, do we agree that this is something that we're going to use as guidance for our actions? And whether we open school, whether we, we uh, close school, whether we adapt things. So is this a model that we want to utilize? I think maybe we should just hear one or two people's questions. And if they're still doing the same thing, going forward and not really at this point, then we just make the decision. 
Okay. So we have four hands raised. Okay. So the next speaker, Melina Watts, your hand is still up. I will unmute you and see if you have another comment. Oh, Melina, your hand went down. The Brown family is next. I'm unmuting you. There we go. Um, so I think what we're talking about is the different stages throughout California, um, the way things have been shut down and keeping our school in line with those stages. Correct. My thought with that is um, the stages that were, sh when we started to shut down, it was back when we had no cases, but now we have so many cases. And the push to reopen is based on the economy and not on the safety of the children. And when they talk about um, the safety of everybody, it's about distant, like being socially distant and wearing masks, children are not able to do that. So I don't think we can go with, um, based off of the state's recommendations as far as things that are opening and closing, because these are our children. That's all, thank you. Okay, next. Okay, the next one is only the initials MH. MH, you are going to be unmuted and I'm lowering your hand. Okay, that one has disappeared. Is this me? I think you guys unmuted me and I'm not MH. I'd like a second chance if that's me. It is you, correct, yeah, thank MH. you. MH, yep. yeah, thank you, I appreciate it. You know, um, hearing everything that's been talking tonight, like I feel there's a lot of suggestions, but no real foundation on how to move forward. And I completely agree with the family that spoke before me that's spoken for the second time tonight. And I give all of you the grace to let me speak finally and for them to speak twice, but there's no protocol. There's nothing for any of us to rely on and make a decision on. And so how do you want to move forward and instill confidence in these few county families so that we can actually send our families back to school? You know, like how, for the families that aren't essentially nice. that don't need to send their kids back to school, like how are we gonna be motivated to send our kids back to school? Like what, what actually is the protocol? Like you've, I've heard a lot of imperatives and suggestions, but nothing actually of like what the day is gonna look like. We're working through the process right now. This is, there are, this is, there are three questions that we are dealing with right now. And at the end of that, you will have a clearer picture. So please stick with it. Just please listen and um, it shall be revealed. Okay, Madam President, we have now six more hands. Okay, but we already said we're only gonna do five. Correct, so. I believe we have one more. We have one and, more. And um, then the remaining of the people will put their comments on the chat. Okay, Stephanie Mittman, you're Waiting for it to unmute. Okay, Hello. Stephanie. Yeah, this is Stephanie and Alan Mittman. Um, a, a couple of questions directed to this uh, part of the discussion. Number one, where did these four stages that are on the screen come from that are aligning to county stages of reopening. Number two, um, there are 31 counties now that are on the county monitoring list for three consecutive days that will require additional shutdowns uh, that have been previously ordered. Which one of these four stages that are on the uh, screen align with the county monitoring list further closures that um, may well be uh, imminent in the county. Thank you. We are, yeah, we are currently in stage two. Um, and we were, we did have a, a 2B. I believe we are no longer there because of the shutdown of in, uh, in restaurant dining, the shutdown 
of salons. So we are in stage two. Uh, the other aspect of this is uh, if, and we do not change, charge, um, control this, if Butte County is put on the list, we cannot come off the list. Only the governor can take us off the list. So it will be um, being marched to a very specific destination if we get put on that list. Uh, and it is just to answer the, the question about who developed this, this was a development from the governor. Yeah. And the governor is utilizing it to uh, further, uh, you know, shut things down, open things up, and uh, we, we have not been, though, um, I, I'm a little confused, because we have not suffered the uh, shutdowns that, say, San Diego and the larger, and those 30 counties have suffered. We still do have access to certain services like hairstylists and, and various things like that. We haven't suffered that setback. We have suffered some, which were statewide, which had to do with the restaurants, but we, we haven't gone to the further uh, regression that some of those other larger counties have, those 30 counties that are on the watch list. And it's my understanding if we are on the watch list, then that is when those uh, additional services right. start right. being right. diminished. They do, and, but we're not on the watch list, yeah, correct? Not yet. We are not, not yet. yet. I mean, somebody mentioned, oh, we're heading in that direction, and that's why we're having this conversation, because if we do, then we will respond appropriately. Is that number five? Yes. Okay. So now it's up to us. Okay, so um, this is really just a, a, a method of how we're going to respond to things. So um, unless anybody has any, yes, Eileen? No, I'm not the anybody that has any. I was, Madam President, I, I appreciate how clearly you've um, outline for us um, what it is we're doing. What we're saying is that we intend to follow the mandated guidelines of the Butte County Department of Health, which in some cases gets direction from the state that mandates what they tell us. And once that mandate comes down, Butte County can't take us off the list and open us back up. At that point, the governor must do it. Uh, so I think at least I understand what the parameters are, and I believe that um, the, it, it's wise of us to stick with um, what's been outlined uh, officially by Butte County Department of Health and the state mandates, and, and their framework comes from the uh, uh, Department of, of uh, the CDC. Correct. Yes, Kathy. So uh, in many ways, this is a statistical model. Uh, it's based on uh, population of our county, and it's based on the number of cases, uh, as well as our health care uh, access. To me, it's the only logical framework uh, because we will be ordered anyway. Yeah. And so what I really value about our staff and setting this up so is that staff and parents can understand what would happen if we were to get moved to a different stage. This is like, you know, I wish I could say it's knowing when Christmas is coming but it also means knowing when Halloween's here or you know, going to the dentist or whatever you think the boogeyman is. So um, it's just logical to me, and I think it's helpful once people realize we will be moved by others, uh, potentially from one stage to another, but we will have a, an approach, a plan to do so. Okay, thank you for, for clarifying that. Uh, so are we at a point now where the board would like to vote on whether this is going to be our approved way of, of uh, addressing and responding to changes in stages? I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready to make a motion to approve the California stages of reopening as our framework. Second. 
Okay, I have a motion by Linda Hovey. I have a second by Dr. Kaiser. Any further discussion? All those in favor of using this, please say aye. 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 All right, we passed that unanimously. So that will be what we are looking at so we can inform uh, parents. And like Dr. Kaiser said, they can become aware that um, there is a correlation there. Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about is um, if, if it is possible to modify uh, instruction and instructional models so that children can actually be on site. What what are the various options? Okay, and uh, what I'd like to do now is turn it over to um, Mr. Marchant and John Shepard to talk a little bit about the the one model that will be consistent regardless of where we are. An option that will always be available, and that is our online independent study. Uh, Mr. Shepard oversees that, and. Uh, Either one of you can go ahead and kick off that discussion. Yeah, just first, because we've had a lot of comments about if we're going to be safe and how we send, you know, I don't know if I feel comfortable bringing my child back on campus. We wanted to make sure that people understand our online option at Oak Bridge Online Academy. We also had a comment earlier about our distance learning and how maybe it wasn't successful for that one family. We want to be able tonight just to explain the difference between that, and I'm going to kind of hand that off to. Um, um, director Shepard and my other elementary director, um, Mr. Sullivan, to kind of go over the two different options that we will be giving with the, on our Oak Ridge Online Academy. So, Mr. Shepard, if you want to talk about the ingenuity option for 612. Sure, thank you. So, I think it's important that, the, um, that everyone understands we're separating distance learning from online learning, knowing that our teachers had virtually 48 hours to turn around from in-classroom instruction to distance learning. And Oak Bridge is not distance learning. It's been in place for a number of years with an established, flexible uh, program offering with experienced teachers prepared to work with students. I think that's a, a really clear distinction that we need to make. Our teachers worked extremely hard during the spring. However, they're only given two days. Oak Bridge is not that, that same um, delivery. They've been around for a while, and they have been working hard with our students. As you can see in, on, online, if you're listening over your phone, it is a school of choice. We do offer um, the opportunity for students who are attending Oak Bridge to also participate in extra and co-curricular activities back on their neighborhood school sites. So for example, if you attended Oak Bridge as a former Chico High student, uh, you could still participate as a cross-country runner at Oak Bridge. We also offer concurrent enrollment, so students could be enrolled in two courses at Chico High and take four courses at Oak Bridge or vice versa. I think that's, as I said, it's an extremely flexible um, op option for our students. It's also a very scripted curriculum that is A to G. So grades 9 through 12, it's A to G compliant. And it is a lot friend, more friend, family friendly for our families to be able to follow and track their students' progress. And they will also be meeting with teachers weekly. And have also, we've talked to parents, if that becomes an, a problem that they feel still uncomfortable with having their student meet with one of our teachers one-on-one -on -one weekly, we can, pro we can make that a Zoom for them. But right now, we would love for them to meet with their teacher one-on-one -on -one every week. But again, if they have concerns about doing that, we can do that with a Zoom. So actually, um, could you paint, uh, Jay, a little picture as to really what that would look like? Because it, one of the people who commented said, you know, really, what, what is this going to look like? And, and I understand that that would be probably helpful. So show what a, like what a day or what a week would be like for somebody who is a student in Oak Bridge Academy. Sure, first um, they will be assigned one of our teachers. That teacher then will sit down with them and the parent to go over what their schedule would look like, what classes that they needed to take for their grade level. And they would align their classes for them first. They will go over what the progress monitoring looks like when they get those classes and what they should be doing weekly and what the assessments will look like and the quizzes look like. They will also talk to them how they can give them more support if they're struggling or if they're moving forward, how they can continue to move quicker if they would like to. Also what it looks like right now, this past year since 2016, we've been holding the Oak Bridge model at, at the mall. We still have that available, but right now we're going to see how many parents decide if they want to go to that online, if we need to start using some of our classrooms 
that are empty because we have so many students that are going to the online mo model with Oak Bridge that the families can meet one-on-one -on -one with their teacher in an empty classroom also. So we'll, that will be looking like where they're going to meet. Could be in a classroom on one of our campuses or at Oak Bridge at the mall. All right, then at the elementary level, I'm gonna have Mr. Sullivan kind of discuss what that'll look like. So elementary uh, Oak Bridge version will be drastically different than what we went through with um, our spring. Um, we've actually gone out and done some intentional uh, things differently to, to prepare for it. We've purchased specific curriculum that's much more online friendly. We bought uh, Wonders online and I Ready Toolbox for math kinds of supports also. We have it set up so that you will see if, if I have a student who's participating in the elementary Oak Bridge version of online learning, they will receive a daily math lesson in person or on, via Zoom, I should say, with the teacher. They'll receive a daily math lesson, English language arts lesson, daily with them. They'll receive follow-up homework with it also. So they'll be having daily contact with that teacher for core curriculum instruction. They'll also have a, a weekly check-in, kind of an individualized check-in with them also. So homework will be going back and forth We're using Google to kind of pass things back and forth with it also. Um, we had lots of questions about students with IEPs or students that are participating in special programs like the dual immersion program. We started talking with how to set up supports and put um, so put those supports in place to keep those programs viable or meet students' needs with IEP concerns as well. So I would just say it will be a very different experience. It'll be much more of a more of a classroom type experience using Oak Bridge because they will be on Zoom daily with that teacher and following through and teacher will be assessing. They've got kind of a scope and sequence of what's gonna be happening with the curriculum already laid out, when assessments are gonna be given. So parents will get those results back. They will see how their children are progressing. So I would say it's, it's, it'll be a vastly different experience. So it sounds to me like it would be a lot more structured and there'd be a whole lot more accountability Absolutely. and uh, consistency in the model that is being is being taught Absolutely. across very, very perfect description across the board. Yes. Dr. Yeah. Kaiser. So uh, my question uh, and we saw this showing up in a lot of the queries from parents and some of the despair. Um, so part of it is many parents felt uh, overwhelmed uh, by what they were expected to do to help their student through it and uh, accelerated perhaps by their student's disengagement. So um, in a student, elementary student, let's say second grade, uh, how much of the morning or the day are they going to be on Zoom and does the parent have to be there, which I would think, to have that happen, or unless you make it a video game, then mine, mine can do that, you know. But. <laughs> so but we laid it out, Kathy, that if it's a K-2 student, we would be expecting they're gonna be having about three hours a day worth of schoolwork, interaction, kind of independent follow-up work as well. Clearly, a six-year-old is gonna need a lot of parent support to be participating with an online program. Just the nature of you know being six, you're gonna need that kind of parent ability to follow up with those kinds of things. Obviously, a fifth grader could maybe have a little bit less kind of parent support with those kinds of things. We've also laid it out and are expecting our fourth and fifth graders to have about four hours a day, roughly, of school-connected activity. It's not all going to be Zoom with that teacher. There'll be some follow-up work for them to do independently. Um, so three to four hours a day of expected learning time will be kind of set up like that with certainly some additional follow-up. It could be independent reading. It can be different kinds of things like that also. And we are also, in connection with that, we are, we're also going to be providing information and uh, instruction to parents on how to be supportive of this type of learning, which we didn't really have an opportunity to do in the spring. Is that correct? Absolutely. We, uh, we've already had, we had a, a host of teachers that were interested to be teaching in that. We actually had a, about an hour-long discussion with them, kind of walking through what the expectations would be with it, what the program looks like. We want to have that same kind of an orientation with parents as well. So if they are interested after what happens tonight, what options are out there and they can choose into it, we want to walk through with an orientation with them, try to answer as many questions as possible and kind of let them know how the program will work and what their part will be with it and what, what their day is going to look like basically with their child at home, what they're choosing to do online learning with an elementary student. So Ted, uh, maybe I just need clarification. So uh, will the Zoom meeting have you know, I don't know, seven, seventh grade, seven year olds working at the same time together? I think, Kathy, if we get, or Dr. Kreis, if we get enough students, it would almost be as, be as if here's the 22 students that are assigned to the second grade teacher, and that second grade teacher is going to run with those 22 students as if that teacher is their teacher. 
for 22 students. They're gonna be teaching a math lesson to those 22 students. They're gonna teach an English language arts lesson to those 22 students. They're gonna teach a follow-up social studies lesson to those 22 students. They're gonna receive homework from those 22 students. They're gonna provide feedback to parents how their child is progressing with those 22 students. They're gonna have individual once a week check-ins with those students, but those are gonna be their 22 students that they are responsible for and teaching all those different subject areas, just like an elementary classroom is typically set up. Can you address uh, grading? I know that was an issue from last year, and we in need to be very clear on that. We, we have a scope and sequence set out already with the two core curriculum, the Wonders and Toolbox, where we have it set out as far as like what assessments will be given, when they'll be given, and kind of be able to share those information with parents as they're doing the different tests as they're going through it. Um, we'll also be expecting teacher, or excuse me, the students to be doing typical kind of district assessments as well to kind of monitor reading progress with some of those things. We know that will look a little different if they're doing it online versus sitting next to their teacher and doing some of those kind of pre-reading assessments and some of those things. But we also talk with teachers and they know they will be doing some kind of assessing with them as well to kind of monitor reading skills, math skills, all of those kinds of things as well. The advantage to grading through Edgenuity is that it's consistent across all the, all the course modules. Uh, there, isn't as, there isn't much subjectivity as we oftentimes see in, in uh, traditional school models. And so students can expect the level of rigor and the grades that are related to that rigor. So one of the things that came up and was commented on quite frequently was uh, the, uh, the fact that parents um, saw that, you know, if the children's interest was lagging and their motivation was lagging and they had difficulty um, enacting the discipline that was necessary as far as keeping the kids, you know, um, uh, on their lessons and focusing on their lessons and, and you know, it was like a struggle. And we saw that through how things dropped off as far as, you know, kids getting on the computers and, and doing the lessons that they were supposed to be doing. So with the uh, models that we're using for Oak Ridge, um, what is different about them that would help parents not end up in that same boat where they're having to, you know, drag their kids to the, <laughs> you know, complete their work and struggle with them? Because certainly that's every parent's nightmare. Again, if we talked about if a student starts struggling, they're assigned a teacher above what their curriculum is given to them. That teacher will monitor their progress. They will have constant contact with them. It won't just be the one week. If they feel that they're not, if they're falling behind, even during that week, they will receive an email. They could possibly get through Google Voice a phone call from them. So they ch constantly checking in. Are you needing more support? Do you need my help? Let, let us know. Then what we've done with Oak Ridge, our teachers have said, we've gone to two days a week. You're gonna need now to come see me two days a week because I feel that you're starting to fall behind and we wanna give you more of that. In the past, we've had tutorial, um, math, English, and science for them. We're gonna to have to try to figure out how we're going to be doing that through Zoom coming up this year and we'll, we'll be doing that now. Um, but that'll be also an offering for them. So again, that teacher's job is to now track them to make sure they're staying on progress also, and then they contact them constantly. Then we also have an administrator that is assigned to that school. Um, her name is Rhonda Olam. She also will contact families when they feel that their child is falling further behind to talk about, hey, I think you better bring you, yourself in and your child in, and let's talk about what your child's struggling with because we really need to get them back on track. And if, if a student is not, this isn't the best fit for them in in uh, this type of independent study, are they able to then move into another uh, option if, if an option is offered? Yes, based on the stage that we are in, uh, they would be able to do that, yes. Okay, any other questions that the board has about this particular model? So I'm just wondering if, if it, we should um, entertain any questions about this model right now before we move to another one? Okay. Yeah, because I, I, I think it might get a little confusing if we go on to another model. So if there are questions uh, out there of, that people might have about this independent study model that will be offered through Oak Bridge for anyone who does not want to uh, entertain the notion of having your child be on a regular campus, we okay. can take that. Okay, we're gonna work through five speakers. The first one is Morgan Oyola. Morgan, I'm going to unmute you. 
I say with confidence. <laughs> and lower Hi. your hand. There you go. Hello. Hi. Actually, I was uh, I had raised my hand at the previous one just to give you guys a, um, a thumbs up for trying to move through the thing methodically. So I'll give my turn to the next person waiting to ask questions about Oak Ridge. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. That's very no generous of you. So our next speaker would be Daniela Botello. Daniela? Let's see, Daniela, you do not have a microphone, but you have raised your hand, so it's impossible for me to unmute you. Um, I'm going to move to the next speaker, and hopefully you can find a way to um, add a microphone. Our next speaker is Matt Kerher. Matt Kerher, I'm going to unmute you. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Oh, you can. Okay, good. Um, I actually uh, raised my hand also for the previous one. Um, but regarding distance learning for the really younger kids, I've noticed it's really difficult for them to find any connection uh, through Zoom uh, where it's um, any kind of productive. So I'm just wondering how doing online lear learning would work for, say, a kindergartner. Having 20 kindergartners try to watch, um, you know, cartoons about <laughs> practice. <laughs> super helpful. But then also I'm curious as to during the stages, which is when I raised my hand earlier, um, I'm curious as to why it hasn't been talked about how being a student could potentially be essential. Um, I understand getting my haircut is not essential and I'm fine with bypassing that. But being a student and getting an education in a social environment is quite essential to many students, especially the younger ones, like I said, kindergarten or children who have trouble learning without that touching type abilities. Um, so I'm just curious that I guess that's two different questions. So how is the online going to be working for younger kids and why are kids not there? Uh, education not being considered as something essential. I, I can share a little bit about the uh, young child version of things, and I actually had a chance to watch several teachers last spring as we moved into this, and I actually watched kindergarten classes doing leveled reading groups with kids in different waiting rooms, and Dynamite teacher um, who had things organized and was clicking through it, obviously with a lot of parent support from the home side of things as well, but this teacher was actually going through and had three or four different groups of students that she was rotating through and doing very high quality phonics lessons, similar, not certainly nothing is as good as in, as in person, but was doing a very quality job making sure students were getting some reading skills covered, and she was doing this on a daily consistent basis. So I, I watched it, I think in person is better, but certainly for different reasons and different needs, if we have to offer online and have it out there, we've seen it in place and we've seen it happen, and teachers do a really good job with it. And how about people, who, kids that don't have parents that can sit next to them? What if both parents are essential workers and they're going to work? How is that going to function with no parent to be there with that kindergarten child? I, not, not sure what to share with that one. Sorry. Okay, we have unmuted Athena. Athena, your microphone is open. I'll lower your hand. You're not. Hi everyone, thank you for this opportunity. Um, I want to share a little bit of our experience with Oak Bridge uh, in case some parents are uh, curious and want to know. Oh, and also I have a um, uh, question related to Oak Bridge. Uh, first of all, two of my children took class uh, at Oak Bridge the past year. Um, I want to say that the ingenuity program, we really like it a lot. It's very structured and very rigorous. Uh, they, they make the video very short, just a couple minutes, so the kids can stay focused and they break down each topic into very small units. And the parents can, can monitor the children's activity and can see how much time they spend oh, on what is that? What did you and uh, to see if mm -hmm. the children are struggling with certain topics. And the staff and the um, teachers at Oak Bridge are really amazing, are very, very good and very helpful. But of course, every family situation is different. Every child learning style and preference is different. This is just our experience. Um, now comes to my question is, I look at the program and the courses offered by Oak Bridge and had communications with teachers there. Um, based on my prior knowledge, uh, for high school courses, we don't offer AP classes because we don't have certified teacher. 
now since we have we might potentially have more demand and more students enroll in Oak Bridge using this um, courseware, are we able to staff teachers who are um, um, certified to teach AP classes? Are we able to offer AP classes to high school students? That's yes, all we, my question. Thank you. Yes, we're extremely excited. We just started the conversation with Edgenuity on Monday, and we have no doubt that we'll be offering AP courses um, starting on August 17th. So we, we are prepared for that. Okay, our next speaker will be Don. Don, I'm going to unmute you. Go Thank ahead, Don. you. Um, I share some of the concerns in the chat, but I also was wondering as a Rosedale parent in um, with children in immersion and knowing um, that many of our teachers are not feeling safe going back and they can speak for themselves, um, will there be an option for them to teach online, whether it's with Oak Ridge or with our own school? And if so, will we be able to be matched with our own teachers and continue the immersion? Um, and then the other question is, could we, are we making a decision for the school year with, with the flexibility of, you know, going back as those cases continue to rise? Or are we able to say that for the trimester or for a semester, it makes sense given our current situation with the numbers going up exponentially in our own community um, to be online right now and then switch over to in-person if it makes sense in the spring? So I'll answer the, uh, the Spanish language question first. And absolutely, if we can uh, encourage teachers that are Spanish capable or Spanish language proficient, dual bilingual like that, we would love to have them over there. And if, we, if there's a way that we can match up students from Rosedale with teachers from Rosedale in the Oak Ridge program, we would absolutely love to do that as well. If we are not able to do that, we've already started having conversations with Mrs. Betancourt about how can we hire somebody that can provide some Spanish language development um, lessons to students on a regular basis so that that language would at least stay there and, and being used on a semi-regular basis. Um, certainly daily, 90% of the lessons is better, but we at least wanna make sure there's some ongoing connection to Spanish language development like that as well. And your second question about students being able to move between um, programs as needs indicate, absolutely. We want, if families are happy at schools, we want them to be able to get back to that, fam that school that they're happy with. A um, little bit of timing issue, it might be happening at the trimester in the elementary world, just so that we can make sure we can accommodate and get those things to happen. But we definitely want to have a path in place for you to get back to a school that you'd like to get to. Okay. Will, we they, will we lose the classes, though? Because if, let's say, 30, 40, 50 percent of students jump over to Oak Ridge for a trimester or a semester, then will the will they be letting go of teachers or will they be sitting you know in very very small classes until those students return there will be a little mix of both of those i think we'll probably have some small classes left at school sites but we'll also have some teachers will end up staying over at the online option as well so there will be definitely different teachers kind of depending on what's happening with with family choice over the course of the year as well thank you Yes, we have one more speaker and just want to remind everyone after this last speaker, there was a Facebook Live that is now on our um, website that has will be able to answer many of your questions as well. So Marcy Lynn, Marcy Lynn, you are our last speaker on this topic. Thank you. I really appreciate your time. You know, I've got two children in the Chico Unified School District, and one of them is a LSD student. He needs special attention. He relies on, you know, um, computer programs to read him and literature that he needs to read. He's at a fourth grade level. And as far as opening up a campus to, like, um, facilitate children's learning, I feel like opening up a campus for um, LSD students is most important because those are the students that can't be teached at home. So, um, you know, that's one of my biggest concerns. You know, I have two children. I have one that's going into first grade. I have one that's supposed to enter fifth grade. And my fifth grade student is an LSD student. And I would really like to hear some response to how the school district is going to advocate for those students. Like, how are they going to get the programs they need to, like, pass a standardized test? Should a standardized test be presented to them in the next six or eight or 12 months? You know, like, 
and we talk about testing, we talk about butts and seats and all those things. And um, these children that are not learning at the same developmental rate as all the other children are the ones that need most attention. How are we gonna address that? Okay, thank you. I would just like to be sure that um, anyone who still has their hand raised will lower their hand and add your comments to the chat, please. Okay, um, the question, I think that last question had to do with special needs children and we are working on trying to, we, we are bound to follow children's IEPs. So if this is a special needs child, my assumption would be that that's what would dictate yes. their instruction. Yes. yes, there's nothing in the learning models that relieve us from the responsibility to follow a student's IEP. We are still bound to that mm -hmm. um, at both the state and federal level. I uh, don't know if we can zoom Diane Olson in if she has a quick response to this, but the, sh the, the short answer is we will continue to provide for our special needs students. Hi, this is Diane. I've unmuted myself and hold on. Okay, I had an echo, sorry. Can you hear me okay? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering where my phone is. Like, I'm not sure if you can hear me because I'm not hearing you at this point. Oh, oh. we can hear you. Here we go. We can okay, hear now. you, Diane. Okay, perfect. Okay, um, so Diane for special on. education, um, all services and all of these models Which will be aligned to the IEP. And as soon as we have uh, a decision on models, our team is ready to start looking at IEPs and implementing services as needed and appropriate for every student depending on the model they, they choose. And we're looking at ways to support service providers and making sure that students can access those services appropriate to them. So again, just like um, they were saying in general education that March through June model of distance learning was a struggle for special ed. We are looking also in special ed of beefing up those services so that there are either um, direct services, appointment-based services, or if we're in any type of school model, those services are directly in school. So thank you for that question because it's something I want to make sure that special ed parents did understand we are working on those service models now. Diane, it's really important. Uh, we're having technical difficulties with the audio from uh, what you've just said. So could you write everything that you've just said in the chat um, so we can be sure that our community understands exactly what you've said? I can do that. I'll move over to that chat from this one right now. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, okay. Diane. You're welcome. Okay, so I think at this point, since the remainder of the comments are going to go into the chat, um, we will look, uh, move then to the other options, the learning models. I'm sorry, the instructional models. Mm -hmm. Mr. Marsan. So we're gonna be moving on to um, the different models that match up with the different stages and then we'll kind of be going over every one of those for you. Again, we just want to make sure that you guys understand the Oak Ridge model does fit for all of them, so we will be going to what it would look like on our schools under those different um, stages. Okay. okay, we're going to start with stage four. Stage four, again, we talked about earlier, that's pre-COVID. We're good with everybody. We can send everybody back without safety precautions. We're back in school. You can do Oak Bridge Online Academy or you can choose one of our schools to attend. That's stage four. So that, that's pre-COVID time in the go with. Now stage three. Stage three is now that we do, we're allowed to go to traditional but with safety guidelines. And the safety guidelines is ones that you have approved before, the temperature checks, the hand sanitizer stations at the be in the ingress of the schools, inside the classrooms, and we'll be having um, plenty of
cleaning going on on our campuses for that. So that's stage three with safety modifications. So regular um, traditional school, but with all the safety guidelines in place. Stage two, which is where I believe where most of our conversation will go to, that will be when we have to have social distancing inside the classroom. We will be uh, um, showing you some different models tonight. We, have, we reviewed them last week also at the board meeting. This is where we will want half of our students on our campus at one time. So if we have a school of 900 at Marsh Junior High School, we will only be bringing in 450 of those students on at one time. So we'll be looking at different models. I'm gonna have uh, Mr. Shepard talk about the secondary models and then I will be having- um, I was getting an echo when I was talking. <laughs> Thank you, Diane. And then we're going to have Mr. Sullivan talk about the elementary models. Okay. And I just want to um, note, uh, stage one, we just spent a lot of time talking about um, Oak Ridge and online learning. So really, Jay's absolutely right. The majority of our time now needs to be spent talking about the modified traditional models. Yes, so if we go to stage one, we're going to use the Oak Ridge model on all of our campuses. Okay, thank you, Mr. Marchant. So we're going to walk through three options. Uh, these options have been vetted with staff for the past uh, six to seven weeks. Uh, we've been discussing different uh, nuances of these options. So the first option is a three by three model. So what that means is students, as Mr. Marchant said, we would have a, a significantly reduced population on campus. They would be enrolled in three classes for the first semester, and they would receive full credit for a year's worth of curriculum in one semester. Normally a student takes six classes, so obviously that would be cut in half, but the timeline for the curriculum to be delivered would be one semester. As you can see in the descriptors underneath option one, that um, we would basically, they'd be receiving 30 credits. Over the course of the year, they would complete all six courses that they've already registered for. Please remember that registration for their courses has already taken place. They're already slotted into classes. We've created staffing for those classes. All that occurred in, in January and February. And then at semester, after the first three classes were completed, they'd move to the next three. Okay, um, I just want to suggest in the interest of time, we're trying to develop more flexibility, and if this is the only model that requires the full year commitment and that we cannot do any transitioning depending upon the stages that uh, we happen to be in, that it pretty much eliminates this model from our consideration. So I would suggest, I would recommend that we remove this model from consideration and so that we don't have to talk about it. I confer, ma con <laughs> concur, Madam President. Okay, how, do, how does everyone feel about that? Tom? I agree with you. Okay, Linda? You know, I have heard from teachers. I mean, I have heard from some staff that um, they do like that model, but, you know, in looking at the staging that we just approved, it will not work. We cannot make that your commitment, so let's go forward. Okay, so we're, we're gonna remove from consideration at this point that model, which is a three by three model, and uh, we'll look at a couple others. Okay, so option two is a year-long model. It's a six period, oh, whoop, let's go down a little bit. There we go, thank you. And alternating day schedule. So students are enrolled in six classes per semester. They receive five credits. Um, student groups A and B each represent half the student body. They would attend um, their they're, they would be in, in attendance three days a week, which is a huge advantage to this schedule, um, rather than five over a two-week period with the previous one. Um, they would see the te their te all their teachers on one day. It could be a Monday, it could be a Wednesday or a Friday. They'd see all their teachers, and then they'd see their teachers two more days, probably alternating, and for, obviously for a total of three over the course of one week. Um, the, one of the advantages, as you can see here, is that we could potentially move into or out of the schedule uh, within the school year. Okay, Tom? Yeah. How many student contacts is that per teacher in a given uh, day or week? Remember, I'm an English major. <laughs> well, Mike, so I guess my point is, this, does this 
substantially lower the number of contacts a teacher has with students from the traditional model? From a traditional model, yes. So at secondary, the maximum number that <clears throat> can be staffed is at 175. They're usually about 160, 165 on average. So that would be half of that on any given, um, any given day. So class sizes are about half that. At elementary, the class sizes are a little different. Ted, maybe you can talk about that. We'll move okay. to the elementary after we do the second. But okay. over the course of the week, they'll see the same number of students as they would have? That's correct. Okay, thank you. That three by three model, I think, has the least contact. My concern here is that least I- Least amount um, of contact. As, as a teacher myself, and uh, as part of my job is to advocate for the teachers, I know that many of them are concerned uh, about limiting their contact with students um, in order to avoid possibly uh, getting the virus. Right, it doesn't impact the uh, contacts for the teacher, only yeah. the students. Thank you. Okay, and the third option is the AM PM model. So again, students would take six, six classes, uh, receiving five credits for each of those. Um, however, the significant change is they would be attending school daily, but have either an AM schedule or a PM schedule. And again, the students, the student groups would represent about half the population in the school. They would attend class five times um, every two weeks. So for example, the first week they would be in, they'd be in person Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and the second week they would be in person Tuesday and Thursday. So over the course of two weeks, they would see their teachers five times. And again, like option two, we could move in and out of, out of, the, uh, out of the schedule. So John, I just want to get clarification. Uh, when we say they're in class, they still have academic work that's scheduled on the days they're not in class. Correct. And that's, that's online assignments or mm -hmm. homework or whatever. Yeah, the, the phrasing we're using right now, Dr. Kaiser, is extended learning. Okay, thank you. I mm -hmm. knew there were three, but that's yeah, good. Yeah, thank you. Any questions from the board? On the secondary level, yeah, please let us know if you have any questions for any of us. Elementary versions really kind of revolve around two choices. We would have either an alternating day, and kind of an example might be a half of the students showing up on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, the first week, and that same half of students showing up on Tuesday, Thursday, the following week. So teacher would be seeing half their students on any given day um, with extended work, obviously for those students who are not in person there on that day as well, as Dr. Kaiser asked. Um, so over the course of a two-week period, they would see they would, students would be there attending five of those days out of any given 10. The uh, AMP model, a little bit different. Half of the students would be showing up for a morning version of school, change over time, uh, and then the other half of the students would be showing up for a afternoon version of that school day as well. And in those, in the AMP model also, there would be homework, kind of follow-up work assigned where students would have things to be worked on at home uh, as well. So, Ted, um, I have one that has gone through kindergarten and first grade at Emma Wilson. And I have to say that the quality of the teacher-student interaction was so dramatic there and the amount of voluntary social control that happened because of the quality of the teaching was just extremely impressive. And I did work some in the school uh, my spouse did a lot more than I did. It seems to me at the elementary level that I, I'm afraid it would be disjunctive to only see your teacher every other day. I don't know how the social expectations of being in class and interacting would can be conveyed. Uh, it just seems like uh, an AM PM thing where they see their teacher five days a week would be the most, uh, and again, I'm going off his experience, the most reinforcing because he cried when he found out that because he was getting promoted to another grade, he wasn't going to have the same teacher. It was that emotionally, you know, secure and rewarding for him. So, Dr. Kaiser, we, as we, we've shared these options and had taken a lot of feedback from a lot of teachers over the last several weeks with things. And as we went through it, one of the real strong uh, pluses on the AMPM model that came out from a lot of the primary teachers in particular 
was they would they they wanted to be able to see their students on a daily basis to help with like daily reading instruction, daily math instruction, um, and that, that came out pretty loud and clear that that was a real pro or positive that a lot of teachers saw with doing an A and PM versus the alternating day model. That was the nice sweet one. The other one's coming, and boy, he needs it every day. So <clears throat> another uh, advantage, or I guess. Um, plus maybe of AMPM was uh, brought up at our last meeting by one of the, I think it was one of the teachers who of course is also a parent uh, of a student in the district. And uh, it had to do with having children in different schools. Maybe you have an elementary student and maybe you have a middle school student and trying to get them like if they're both on AM or if they're both on PM or if it's better for have one on one and one on the other. Um, that there's, yeah, that there's the possibility of um, coordinating those things. Yes, there's a lot better possibility of having their families at the same time. I, I'm not going to guarantee you, but there is, we're going to do everything we can if you chose the AMPM model to match it up with the families so they had them at the same time. So, um, and I don't know if, if uh, people want to go through any of the other pros and cons of either the elementary or the, um, yeah, Eileen, sorry. Yeah, I had a comment on, uh, as we were talking about the advantages, I think for those of us that have had experience with um, special education students, the um, pattern of knowing that you're going to be going to school every day is extremely important for kids that use, um, and it's a security blanket. They, they do not adjust well to change from one day to the next. So that's um, you know a significant part of why I support option one. Yeah, I would, I would agree with you on that, that um, structure and having consistent structure is really, especially with kids who do have certain, um, you know, issues. So um, I think that's that's a big plus. And you know, the the self discipline that's developed by doing something time and time again, and and being able to rely on that, and they get used to that, and they, you know, that's that's for expectations with children. That's really important developmentally. Yes, Tom. Uh, both of these models, of course, uh, increase the need for parent uh, to find childcare. Is uh, will we have our same uh, after-school programs from CARD? Thank you for that segue. I'm here to uh, help. We definitely have been having conversations about childcare, and Mr. Sullivan, would you care to address that? Yeah, absolutely. We've uh, we've had a few conversations with CARD and. They are ready, willing, and able to jump on board and start putting child care supports in place, um, very similar to after school. They've even talked about their ability and willingness to do kind of, um, the, if, if families have PM, to put AM support in place also, and part of that falls on us looking for space within our schools and campuses to make sure that there is room available for them to provide that also. And we actually had um, very recently, like Salvation Army, a couple of their outside groups have expressed interest to work with us also and put child care supports in place. So I think, um, I think there's lots of possibilities out there, and I think um, in particular CARD is really gung-ho, and Salvation Army was very supportive in looking to, to partner with us and put those in place. Okay, can you address like some of the uh, challenges that might be in place for the daycare with the alternating day model, the, the time constraints? Yeah, one, one, of the, one of the issues that came up with CARD and talking with Ann Wellman a little bit, CARD has some conditions on how many hours per week a child can be with them with their licensing, and I, I know Ann's on, the, on there someplace, and if I misspeak, but there's some conditions. If, the, if students are participating too many hours, it starts changing some of their needs with licensing with CARD, more into a daycare versus a child care or vice versa with those kinds of things. So the AMPM would help a little bit with some of those hour kind of issues with CARD as well. Also, another advantage, and if Mr. Boltman wants to correct me, but on the AMP model where our students are seeing their, child, their teacher every day with the new guidelines for ADA tracking, it makes it a lot um, more easier or simpler for us to be doing that and meeting those guidelines. Am I correct on that? Yeah, there's been some trailer bill um, bills passed kind of spelling out how we ultimately are going to have to track um, enrollment, ADA, and um, 
our understanding at this point is that the everyday AMPM model would be easier for us to meet some of those audit requirements right out of the gate. Yeah. That's can we get out of this? I mean, yeah. Yes, they're working on matching up what can be seen there with what we have here on the screen. So they're working on matching those two up. Okay. Uh, so any further questions um, or comments about this? Yeah, okay. Uh, do we have people waiting to speak on this or ask questions? We any? do. And our first speaker, let me make sure. While John's doing that, I would like to make a suggestion that maybe because this is the crux of what we are talking about, if we could maybe expand the speaker, uh, allowing people to give input on this particular part. Um, I think this is the high interest area, so maybe we want to expand that to, you know, a half hour max. Well, that would be 10. And so I just want people to realize, you know, if you look at the list of hands and you think you're going to be further back, go to chat. That's a really good way to get your ideas or your comments. The disadvantage they have, Dr. Kaiser, is I don't think they can see the hands, but we do have, right now we have six hands raised. So we have an opportunity for four more. And, and uh, so if you don't raise your hand quickly, you'll need to um, insert your comments into the chat. Okay, we are going to start with Finley is the name I see here, Finley. And if there's clarification between secondary and uh, elementary, that helps too. Can okay, you Finley, your microphone is open. Okay, um, my question is with the plan that is sending half the kids to school at a time, that seems to be a best case scenario would be 15 kids per classroom. And I'm wondering how that's gonna work with six feet social distancing since six feet is, uh, you need 113 square feet. That means 15 kids, you have to have almost a 1600 square foot classroom. So I'm just wondering how the school is planning on addressing that. Even if you go down the 10 kids, you're still at 1,100 square feet. So can you be more specific on how the half day or half the school going uh, is gonna actually work? Well, we have measured out um, our classrooms at 960 square feet is the standard. And um, we think we can still fit half of a class into that space you, and, and still meet um, some social distancing. It may not be specifically the six feet, but it's certainly um, substantial enough that there's gonna be a lot less contact going on in that classroom. So can you tell me what you're considering half a class, how many kids? Because at 900 square feet, you can you can barely get eight kids in there. So are you considering that to be the amount when you're saying half? So it depends on the grade level that we are at right now. Our K3 are at 24, so you cut that in half, you're going to be at 12. Um, our others are closer to 33. And um, again, you cut those in half, you're 15, 16. But we also expect that we are going to have families that make decisions to go to um, Oak Bridge Academy, go to an online learning model. And when families aren't enrolled and when they're choosing another option, that decreases the number of students that would be in a class. So those are uh, items we're going to have to watch very closely. We also are going to have to work with furniture to make sure that we have furniture in place that can accommodate um, you know, the, the social distancing requirements that we would like to have in place. And that may mean that we have to move furniture out as well. Okay, so being that with the, using the 900 square feet that, that was just said by someone on the panel I can't see, um, and that equating to eight students, um, by putting more in there, you're gonna be in violation of the governor's order. And it, by doing so, if anyone gets COVID, the school district will be liable for that pursuant to the laws that are currently in place because there's no immunity for uh, any lawsuit that might be brought where children can get COVID at school because the school's not following directives. So is okay. Chico Unified, is we, Chico we've Unified got, prepared um, to deal with that? 
Yeah, well, we, we've surpassed the, the three minute time limit right here, not to cut you off, but um, just, just to mention on that um, is those I think have not been determined yet, that has that still um, not been determined. So, um, and there is actually a bill on the floor of the assembly with regards to liability, with regards to schools and uh, dealing with COVID. Okay, so let's move to the next one. Thank you. This is Elizabeth Stevens. Elizabeth, you Hi. are unmuted. Thank you. Um, okay, so when thinking about these proposed models, I mean, obviously I'm concerned about the safety of students and their families, but I'm um, also very curious how the teachers that serve our community feel about these face-to-face -face models, about the different models being presented, and how they feel about working face-to-face -face versus um, online or a distance learning model. Because I feel like as a family in this community, I wanna know what they're thinking and how they're feeling about this. It's really important to me um, that we hear their voices. Well, we actually have been hearing their voices. We've surveyed them. We've They have been discussing this with their unions and we have actually been um, hearing from them about how they feel about this. So that's who they go to when they have concerns about their work conditions. Also, we want to be able to say that every Monday we had a group of 70 teachers and administrators discussing these models and they vetted these models through us every Monday. We started changing them as they, as they asked for certain um, changes on what they look like. So these are the ones that they came through with us in that process that we had 70 of them, which included the union and teachers. So we did survey our teachers and um, just like parents, they're, they have, they're a mixed group also. Some um, want to get back in the classroom. Some um, have serious um, concerns regarding their own health or health of uh, loved ones that they uh, live with. And so we're in the process of working with our teacher association to um, uh, make lists of teachers. So we're hoping to pair the teachers that have the greatest concerns up at Oak Bridge um, and then the teachers that uh, desire to get back in the classroom to pair them up in their regular classroom. So we're working with the teachers at the same time we're working with parents. Okay, let's move to number three. Okay, the third speaker is under Mike B is in boy. Mike B, you are, your microphone is open. I'll lower your hand. Mike, we can barely hear you. If you could, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm speaking tonight as a teacher and a parent. Uh, I would just like to say that as a teacher, I would prefer an online model for the fall semester. Uh, if I'm forced to go into the classroom in a stage two situation, I think there are advantages to the alternating day schedule because uh, they would have an opportunity to better clean the facilities before or between groups of kids. With an AM PM uh, model, it seems like the PM kids are going to be exposed to any virus that may be left behind by AM kids. And uh, I feel like any limited sterilization that takes place will probably be uh, the teachers sterilizing their own rooms, which uh, won't, be, won't be as thorough as it could be with an alternating day. Okay, thank you. The next speaker we have is, let's see, M Marcy Lynn. Marcy, I'm going to unmute you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. You know, and I love hearing from Mike as a teacher and his point of view. And I'd love to hear more teachers speak up. You know, we're talking about students and their vulnerability, but we haven't put in a protocol for teachers either. And um, all of you know, I've been listening since 6 p.m. this evening, and, um, you know, I keep hearing a lot of suggestions, but I don't really hear any protocols being put in place that make me feel very comfortable as a parent putting my children back in school. You know, I have the flexibility to stay at home with my children as uncomfortable it is with a child that needs more help than I can give them, but you haven't given me any confidence that I should send my kids back to school. And I'm wondering how you'd like to address that for all the parents that still don't feel comfortable, that still haven't felt like you put a protocol in place. 
you know, and by the way, like everything could change in two weeks. And, you know, I mean, Sacramento is already closed down for online schooling. San Francisco is closed down for online schooling. I understand that high school students have a better capability to be successful in online schooling. I understand that my children are disadvantaged at that because they're in grade school and, and, and younger. But, you know, I'm, I'm looking for some vote of confidence that I can instill in you people as the, you know, child guardian per se, because let's face it, most parents put their children in your custody as a child guardianship while they're working and can attend to them. And I'm not in that position. And I want to know that my children are safe in your custodianship. So thank you for your comments. We do have, as we mentioned earlier, for uh, those that are not comfortable returning to an in-person environment, we have a very strong Oakdale Academy program. Yes, that's not comforting. That's not comforting. That's all they could comment. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's move to the next caller, please. Okay, our next speaker will be Maria Sayer. Maria, I'm going to unmute you. There's always a delay here, depending on how close they are. There we go. Maria, your microphone is open. Hi, thank you very much for taking the time to listen to my comments. Um, I first want to say that I completely understand how hard this is on everybody, the board, teachers, parents, and all the other school staff that works for Chico Unified School District, me being one of them. I am a special education aide. I am also the parent of a special education student. Um, one of the comments made in regards to what options will be available to working parents who would have to engage in childcare when their kids are on a possible AB schedule or limited day schedule is the option to use services like CARD. Well, those are not services that are generally flexible or open enough for kids with special needs and severe disabilities. So I'm wondering if there is some discussion within the card realm that would help parents like us who are in that unique need, position. Um, my second comment is this. I was frustrated by a lot of the comments in the chat room because I felt that people weren't stopping and really listening to what is being said. So as a parent and as a special education aide who works for Chico Unified School District, I am ready to send my child back to a limited day schedule. I'm ready to work a full-time schedule. I'm ready to do what I need to do to get through these really difficult times. And I know that people are scared. I know people are worried, but I also think that people need to just be patient and listen for a moment. And those answer answers will be eventually will be coming, but it won't be coming today, tomorrow, or the next day. It's going to take a week or two to really figure this out. So I want to again say thank you for the school district and the parents and the aides and the secretaries and the teachers and the superintendent and everybody who is really working hard on trying to figure this all out. Thank you, Maria. Okay, thank you. Our next speaker is William Nitsky. William, you are your microphone is open. I'll lower your hand. Hi, yes, thank you very much. Um, I just have two uh, questions and comments. Uh, the first question I have is, has there been any discussion on outdoor learning and creating facilities outside that will um, allow students to be outside in a more, um, in what we have seen statistically at least, in a safer, safer environment if, if measures are met? Uh, my second question is, how much have teachers been involved in this scheduling model that you're presenting to us and what are their thoughts? Um, from the teachers I've spoken to, they have said that they have really not been consulted. And even though um, uh, Mr. Marshak mentioned that they were surveyed and then they can go to their union, um, that was only one survey. Parents were actually given two surveys because as you said before, measures have changed, circumstances have changed, and maybe some of the teachers have also changed in their opinions. So I just wanted to mention that and recognize that maybe they should be consulted uh, further. Thank you. Mr. 
Mr. Marchant, you want to talk about the yeah, process? Yeah, again, yeah. I just want to repeat that every Monday that we've been um, zooming in with 70 plus teachers and educators in our district to go over these uh, models. So it wasn't just the survey that we used um, for them. We did send them a survey. We also sent them the same survey that the parents got. So we've actually sent them two different surveys to do that. And we have uh, been receiving emails from them uh, quite a few these past couple weeks. And we've done a pretty good job of responding to our teachers' concerns. And we also meet with our union leadership every week too to talk about concerns and questions that they have that they're hearing from their teachers. What about the outdoor learning comment that I made? Just as a matter of fact, we were meeting with all the music teachers today talking about kind of different concerns they have and that came up as a regular or a big question they had is how do, can we conduct band outside? Can we conduct choir outside? with some of those kinds of things, and if, if that is something that's gonna help them provide a quality experience for students, we, we share with them, we are all in favor of something like that. You know, several teachers have even talked about lunch outside, different ports and portions of the elementary school day outside, and absolutely, if that's something that's gonna fit and work for everybody, we are supportive of those things. Options that fit into that outdoor model could be discussed with the Monday group. At this point, um, you know, in hearing the frustrations of the, of the previous speaker, but at this point, we need to know what that instructional model will be, and then we can start building the program around the instructional model. Thank you. Thank you. I'm attempting to unmute Amy's iPhone. There you go. Amy's iPhone, your microphone is open. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, hi, thank you uh, for hearing me out. Um, I am a teacher and a parent of two Chico Unified uh, students. And it's interesting, I've been watching the chat and it, I see a lot of questions about how are teachers feeling? And you know, I, I'm glad that the focus is on students as it should be, but I don't think we have talked much en or enough about um, what it's like for teachers and faculty and um, certificate everyone else. Um, and I have to say, everyone that I've talked to, we are very nervous. Um, we are very nervous about returning. I think about not only my own health, but what I'm bringing home. And in my household, four of us uh, go to Chico Unified Schools. And so we, I, I did the math. Um, if we go back in any form of traditional model, we will be interacting with well over 600 students a day. If you split that in half, so let's say that we do a half deal, um, you split that in half, that's still 350 minimally that we're in contact with a day. And so I feel very, very nervous about my well-being and my children's well-being. And I don't feel that even with the measures of the PPE or anything else, that that will necessarily ensure me that mental you know, security that I'm not gonna bring something home or one of my children or my husband, that we will all be safe. And so I just, I, I, while I appreciate that the Monday meetings have been happening with 60, 70 staff members, I do want to emphasize that that is not a representation of how all of the Chico Unified teachers feel. Um, because when I speak with all of my colleagues, everybody's in the same boat as me. We're nervous, um, we're scared, we know. We all, every single one of us wants to be back into the classroom. We know that's best for kids but we also value our lives and value the lives of our loved ones. And so I just wanna emphasize that because I see a lot of questions about, about how are the teachers feeling and I don't feel like everything is being represented accurately with how I feel or a number of the people that I speak with. Okay. Thank you, Amy. Okay, our next speaker, make sure I have it on my list here, is Jesse Williams. Jesse, I'm going to attempt to unmute you here. Okay, Jesse, your microphone is open. I'll lower your hand. Hi, um, I just wanted to uh, uh, ask real quick, if the students are going to school and then we move to a phase one and need to be moved to online school, will they be keeping the same teacher or assigned a new teacher? They will be keeping um, their same teacher. If we've already started the school, they will be the school year, we, they will be keeping their same teacher. Unless, you know, I, even if they're at Oak Bridge, they'll be keeping their same teacher, but if they're on one of our school sites, they will keep their own, their own teacher for those lessons, yes. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay. 
Next speaker is Don. Don, I'm going to attempt to unmute you. Thank okay. you. Um, I just had a quick question regarding um, if a teacher or a student in a class tests positive, um, is there going to be, will that class be going online at that point? Will they be going back and forth between online and will they be then losing out on learning or will they be online with this model during that time and then jumping back and forth between online and in person? Thank you for that question. Um, recognizing that we are not healthcare professionals, we have had a committee that has been working with Butte County Public Health um, for the entire county, not just Chico Unified, but all of the school districts in the county. And they have developed protocols for that. We have seen those protocols. They have um, allowed us to look at those in planning. We've had uh, a school, school nurse work on that committee. And we hope to have very soon the ability to share those protocols uh, with our parent community and our community at large because they really do take responsibility. The um, health department takes responsibility for the identification, the notification, identifying who needs to be tested, identifying who needs to be in quarantine, identifying whether or not it's a whole class, a portion of the class. So we look forward to being able to share those. With Dr. Kaiser, did you have that as the 10th? Number 10 is next. Thank you. So the next speaker is Kim Castor. Kim, I'm going to unmute you. Okay, Kim, Hi. your microphone is open. Um, my question would be, um, what will it look like for special education kids with the different models? Diane Olson, do you think you could? Um... Oh, hi, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Can you hear me okay, John? Yes, we can hear you. I'm gonna wait for people in the chat to let me know that they can hear you. You need to go ahead and speak, Diane. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, so for special ed students, parents have the ability to choose the model they would like. And within that model, once we have the parents' choices, our team is going to be spending the rest of the summer reviewing IEPs and making sure that we can develop um, the services and offer those services based on that model, whether it be in school models, Oak Bridge models, or other models um, that a parent choose so that there might be appointment based, there might be in school, there might be online options for services. We are looking at a variety of ways to offer all services needed for all students. Thank you, Director Olson. If you could, um, again, repeat your answer in the chat. We are able to hear you through one platform, but not through all. Thank you. Okay, so at this point, um, bearing in mind that what we're talking about is we're at a moment in time where we are in a particular stage. And we are looking that on August 17th, what are we going to do if we stay in this stage or if we're in a stage which is less restrictive? So um, which of these models would be best suited for us to incorporate at this, at this point in time, knowing what we know now, but also realizing that however things change, if, if we do get put on a watch list, if we do have increased cases, if we do have a heightened risk, we will <clears throat> adapt accordingly. So, but we do need to have guidance and a plan in place as to what we're going to do based on what circumstances exist. So I just, uh, Kathy, did you wanna talk about this? Yes, I was gonna make a, a I was gonna, voice my opinion, I didn't, I thought you were. Yeah, that's fine, okay. I am. Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't mm -hmm, mean to that's interrupt. Okay. So, um, I think a number of speakers have expressed um, just their frustration with the lack of certainty, except I think it's, in real time, it's reality. None of us can ascertain with certainty what's tomorrow or, uh, August 17th will bring. However, 
Um, I strongly believe in the quality of our teachers and their commitment to our students. And so to me, actually, I think for both the high school, uh, secondary, and the elementary, that the AMPM model works. I believe that for students to have the consistency, if it's going to be the morning, then they know what time they have to get up and when they have to get there. And then for the afternoon, uh, again, there's still certainty. There is uh, definitely an issue with uh, parents, but no matter Right now, no matter what we do, um, I think that issue persists. And I think it would be a lot harder for a parent to handle alternating days um, than it would be to have a, a morning or an afternoon schedule. So uh, I just uh, believe that the teacher-student contact, every single one of our students is going to come into a new classroom with the new teacher. That is the nature of progressive education, the way we have it structured in the United States. You move up. And so I think that this time period where they can establish a relationship and they have half of their classmates, but it's the same half. And so I think for them, that's really, really valuable. They'll actually maybe even have uh, stronger relationships with their fellow students. So that's my argument. Yes, Tom. Um, a couple of speakers brought up the, uh, whether the level of cleaning between AM PM shifts was going to be equivalent to the overnight cleaning. Can anyone speak to that, Kevin, perhaps? I think what we need to do is look at our custodial schedules. Currently, we have a morning and an, an evening schedule. We would need to have some conversations about really combining our custodial time so that we had both custodians on site to do cleaning during that break period between the AM and the PM. Um, second, that system that we're looking at purchasing right now, I think would allow us to be much more efficient, be able to get through our spaces. We're also testing foggers, disinfectant foggers that um, we might be able to take into classrooms. And frankly, we'll have to have some conversations, I think, with our um, classified support staff uh, about additional cleaning related to our grounds crew, even our light maintenance. So I think it's one of those things that based on the decision of the board, the goal will be to, to do the, the cleaning that's going to be required to make sure that it's a safe environment for not only the, the morning students, but also the afternoon, if that was the model you chose. Can you spell the word you use, cleaning? Fogger? Fogger? I'm sorry, a fogger, F-O-G-G-E-R. Oh, okay. Apologize. Yeah, there are some, and actually we tested one in our transportation department last week. Um, it's a pack that can go on. It has a spray fogger that you can then go through in a bus, for instance, we were able to disinfect the bus uh, in, in a minute 30. And that was a deep cleaning through the entire bus. So it's just another idea that we're trying to test and see if we have that available to us. But we would make every effort to make sure that our afternoon students had the same clean environment that our morning students have. Could, could I tag on to Tom's question? What about those lights that you can? Yeah, yeah what about those? I think we'd want to look at every option we possibly have available to us. I think one of the nice things is that I think there'll be money um, to be able to do some of these um, needed purchases to make sure we have safe environments through the, the CARES Act dollars. So I think we'll have some resources and we'll research whatever options we have. And I think, frankly, we'll buy what we need to buy to make sure we have a safe environment for students. Happy to leave that. Happy to leave it to you. I just want to make sure that the time and schedule for that cleaning to happen to right. allay some of the concerns of our parents who might end up on a PM schedule. Right. Thank you. Yeah, well, at the elementary level too, Tom, is we'll look at where we keep, if, let's just say there's 24 kids in that K-3 class and we're only bringing 12 in, the A students will only use the A desks. We'll keep the 24 in there. That means 12, 12 of those desks every day will not be used only by PM. So we, yes, you know, the teachers will be looking to see if a student put a hand on another desk, but we're that one student will only have that one desk every day. And then the B students will have their B desk also. So that'll help at the elementary level. Yes, we'll still have to clean the high volume areas, the doorknobs and those type of things, that like that. But I also think that'll help us too, that we're not having to do every desk at the elementary level. 
Okay, there's, there's something else I think that has to be discussed, and that is that um, a lot of students um, are actually reliant upon us for providing lunches. And uh, if there is no school, that would be a very difficult uh, thing to, to do and, and to manage. Um, lower socioeconomic um, members of our, our community um, have a more difficult time with with uh, you know their their work schedules they don't have as much flexibility and so and also not the resources to be paying for childcare for so that is another reason for having school in session at least part of the time if it's any way possible that we can do that uh, there's you know to not have an option if we can have it work if we can make it safe would seem to me to be doing a disservice to parents in the community because, you know, if they if they absolutely need this and we and we take it away when there is a possibility that it would work, um, of course we're going to be very um, diligent and watching to make sure that things are safe. We're going to be monitoring the uh, cases, the rise in cases. We're going to be having constant discussions with public health. Uh, so it's not a matter of we're going to go into this and we're just going to barrel forward and not look back. And if we do make this plan and circumstances change between now and the opening of school, we will not be feeling married to this plan to the point where we can't change it. So I also agree with uh, Dr. Kaiser that uh, the uh, AMPM model would probably be most, um, oh, I don't know, beneficial and workable. And um, so I, I, that's, that's my preference. I mean. Um, thank you, Madam President. Um, is there a way to put uh, the slide up for the AMPM model that has um, the uh, model for elementary and the model for secondary, because there is a bit of a difference between the one that, that meets every day. No, I meant, you mean, yeah, shows that. Yeah, yeah that, that shows one. that. And, and uh, am I correct in assuming that there there is a difference between the um, secondary ask. schedule that does an AM, PM five days a week, or is it exactly the same? They are different, in, and right now, to be frank, Ms. Robinson, we need to be sure that we have ingress and egress nuances addressed. We need to be sure we have cleaning nuances addressed. Yeah. So we have some samples, but we don't want to marry ourselves to those samples yeah. at this okay. point because Again, we need to be sure that we can we can address all those nuances. And um, I also believe that we have some restrictions on PE under the current current stage. Um, am I mistaken? But I uh, I saw a memo regarding uh, uh, the discontinuance of um, the summer athletic programs. Do we have any word yet on what we're going to be able to offer in the way of uh, typical physical education within the school day framework? So physical education minutes um, have been waived. So we have a requirement of how many minutes we have to um, have of physical education every 10 days. So that has been waived for this year, so we would not have to have physical education per se at the elementary level. What has not been waived yet, and maybe it will, but what has not been waived is the graduation requirement for high school. Um, Superintendent Staley, just a, a clarifying question. On bullet four, it says students would attend each class five times every two weeks. Is that yes. the plan for a AM, PM? I, yeah, for secondary. I, yeah, I could. For yeah. secondary. Yeah. Okay. For elementary, they, they would be attending every day. Every yeah. day. Model. Thank you very much. But isn't that because of the length of the classes and everything, right? Yes. You, 
Correct. The secondary three period, they'd go to three periods, and they would be a longer period. Right. And, and so, yeah. But okay. they would be there every single day. Correct. That was the problem I was having in finding what I was looking for in the packet. It's not labeled secondary. Thank you. That's what I was looking for. Liz, may I comment? Yes. So I want to just start off by thanking everyone who submitted their opinions and their views. Um, I read every email and comment and some social media involvement as well. And it was just very important to me. So thank you to everyone who uh, did send in their, their views. My first inclination in reading all those emails was to actually support starting the school year only with online learning. But, you know, after much contemplation and speaking with some families and actually also some teachers, um, I personally feel very strongly that the children, like Dr. Kaiser said, need consistency and they need routine. They need that social stimulation as well. They need their teachers. Um, one parent that I talked to let me talk to her little child and the child was just bubbling with excitement, almost in tears about getting back to school and seeing their teacher. So, you know, I really, I took that into account. Um, I am hopefully optimistic that COVID will run its course sooner than later. Um, and with that in mind and looking at these proposed modified um, options, I, like my colleagues, would like to support the AMPM models for both elementary and secondary um, and continue to pace our full reopening with the phasing and guidance from the state and local health experts. So, thank you. Well, I'm going to throw you all a curveball, and I apologize for that in advance. Um, I agree very much with what you're saying about the consistency and uh, the classroom environment, especially for our younger students, and I would like all of us to very strongly consider the possibility of adopting an AMP and model for uh, a K-5 while starting the year for the uh, secondary uh, classes online to cut down on the total number of contacts uh, that our teachers have. Again, there's a huge level of concern and a lot of that concern is coming from secondary teachers who will see hundreds of kids a day. Um, the numbers in Butte County are going up, and I think we need to think about not only where we are now, but if this trend continues, what phase will we be in by the beginning of the year? Uh, I think there's a really strong case to be made for maybe some kind of orientation, but then having our, our high school students who can handle it start the year in the safest possible environment, especially since most models show that the virus is more contagious among physical adults such as our high school students. I kind of find that interesting in a lot of ways. Um, how easy would it be, I'm going to look at the education staff, to, to do something like that? And Tom, are you thinking like starting six weeks um, of online learning for the high schools or going the full semester? Um, online and then transitioning? We would need to set some, some metrics or ask uh, Butte County to mm -hmm. set, help us set some metrics. Um, we could look at what other uh, localities that are starting online have done. Mm -hmm. um, like we know that uh, Sacramento just went, the whole county went online. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be interesting to know what their metrics were in terms of when they felt safe having their secondary students back. Mm -hmm. And how easy would it be to transition from ingenuity to um, back in the classroom, I could, guess is my other question. Could I get a, a clarification because Tom is saying, and you're repeating him, high school, but yes. we haven't been talking that way. We've been talking secondary. That's true. And so I, I really think it's, you're talking very different because you're talking sixth graders. Sure, correct. Just and that's, starting. I was actually going to go there because I so, might agree with his idea for high school, but not necessarily for middle school. Sorry. My thought was that it would be the high schoolers online and the either an AMPM model like this for middle school or 
ideally, um, middle schoolers in stable cohorts that didn't change much. So I, I know that's a big ask for you guys to come up with another plan. Um, I do think it might be uh, the best uh, combination of safety for all involved and uh, our educational options. Okay, so um, the, Jay, um, you had mentioned before the meetings that were held with the teachers and we know that um, numerous, many teachers participated in those. Was this topic ever broached? Was it considered? Was it suggested? Um, no, it wasn't. Um, the, the models that we came through are the ones that they worked through. Um, again, I'm, I'm not going to comment either way. Uh, uh, Tom's suggestion is coming up. One of the questions I think Linda gave was, would we be able to go back and forth with ingenuity? That would come with the training that we would be doing in August 5th and 6th and August 13th to get our teachers ready because we want all of our teachers trained in both the elementary and uh, the secondary models for ingenuity and the wonders in the toolbox. Um, in tracking where they are and then that's where they would have to pick up when it comes back. The transition, if we were pulled back into stage one after the school started, they would have that teacher already aligned. If we started with high school only, we, we would need to be able to assign a teacher with them and also go through um, Mr. Hanlon and HR and Kevin ready about talking about what teachers and how would we we'd go about doing that. I think the student contact, just to comment on some of the I'm just thinking of the different pieces of that conversation. So thank you, Mr. Lando, for making us think about it. The student contacts would stay the same for middle school and high school, just to be clear. Okay. The student contacts would stay the same for high school under which model? So if they were if you had students in secondary, all of secondary, right, they'd be in, in A and PM, right, they'd stay the same. If you, I guess what I'm, yeah, I just need to do some, some more thinking on the student contact piece. I'll take a look at it. I'm just, I'm trying to give you, to respond back from an educational perspective without getting into contracts or into yeah. um, philosophy, because that's, that's not science. If we went started out with the online model, and again, I'm just think, thinking th through this too in my head, they would be assigned one teacher. If we went into stage two or we went into a modified traditional, they would go to six. Um, if we went from, we started with them in a modified traditional model where they had six and they, we went to online, we would assign one of those six to be their teacher. We were talking about first period, if I'm correct. Right. Um, Mr. Shepard, when we were talking about it on our Mondays, how would we go backwards? Because right now they would have six if we went to a modified. So we would get them down to one and most likely it would be a first period and we teacher, but we would have to work through that. So just to consider, they'd have to be teaching, be able to teach all six of those courses, which um, they're not, you know, they're in high school and junior high, they're more specialized. So that may be fine for lower level, but you get into AP courses, calculus, physics, chemistry, those types of classes, that's going to be a big challenge for, for that individual teacher teaching all of those. So that's one thing to consider. Okay, Eileen, you had a comment? Um, yes, I do. I think um, where I'm coming from that the all online option is one that would only be on the table if we get shut down by having to go back to step one. Um, the fact that we're not there means that we can sit here tonight and look at options that are best for students, families, and teachers. I don't believe, and, and I just experienced a high schooler going through the shutdown in March, and um, it wasn't good, as many parents have indicated. I also don't believe that um, high schoolers have any less need for the contact with teachers than elementary school kids do. That's still where you connect with mentors, where you connect with, you know, with people that inspire you. Um, 
and having an opportunity still, because we haven't been shut down, to have in person for the families that want to choose that, because we're with the offer with the options we're considering, we're considering offering families that absolutely do not want in-person contact the Oak Ridge option. But we're also then offering for the families who feel that that in-person contact is vital between the student and the teacher, that option. And, and I don't want to take that away unless we're mandated to take that away. I too believe that you know, some of the most significant memories in my world of growing up were, you know, my general science teacher in high school or the history teacher. My goodness, the stuff, not only did they teach me, but that they taught me. Um, and I don't want to take that away from the families that feel that's important and are willing to participate in the risks that we're all taking. I mean, this is not risk-free in any sense of the word. For the teachers, for the students, for the families, it's not. But um, I think that we've done a darn good job of trying at this point to fill in with mitigations for what we're facing. And um, so I, I support an option that allows both in person and the Oak Bridge option. Okay, Dr. Kaiser? So um, I'm a first gen uh, college student. Um, and I started as a physics major and I went on scholarships. And I went on scholarships because my high school counselor beat me up almost every friggin' week that I was gonna take some kind of a test. We already know nationally the data on the number of students who even applied for financial aid, who even looked at going to college, plummeted, literally plummeted because they didn't have personal contact with counselors. And their parents weren't prepared or where or didn't have the information. They didn't know how to do it. Um, you don't start college because of your senior year. You start college because somebody started poking you, encouraging you, giving you other ideas much earlier than that. And so, um, and then the same thing happened to me in college where I got kicked, encouraged to go to, go to grad school. So I really do feel that high school students need that kind of inspiration. None of our elementary school and some of our middle school kids will have that click in their head about, oh my God, I'm meant to be an X or a Y or a Z. But typically, it's the high school curriculum that starts to make them see themselves. God forbid you'd be English like John. But, you know, it might be the right thing for you. <laughs> or Kelly or Liz. Uh. <laughs> it might be the right thing. But, but the other fields, the other areas, the APs, the IBs, those come out of somebody really encouraging you to think about that as an option. And so I don't think it's, uh, we can expect parents to have that kind of mirror for their kids because they tend to see their kid the way they presented, you know, for the last 10 years, 12 years, whatever. The teacher sees them as new and sees them as potential and makes it exciting. What it sounds like is that you guys don't believe that personal connections can happen through online teaching. And I think that's a real slap in the face to the teachers who already work at Oak Bridge. The whole point of that program is that it's not like last year, that it is a system in which teachers and students have 
connection and have at least weekly contact, often more, and build those relationships. I don't think we have to be face-to-face -face and put anybody in danger to build those same kind of relationships. I have taught in a similar model for uh, several years, and the possibility of building those relationships without being in the same room is 100% real. I don't think it has to be either or. Um, what we're talking about here is choice, giving people choice. Um, we had somebody who called in, Athena, who uh, attested to the fact that the Oak Bridge program is excellent and her children do have excellent relationships with her teachers and she thought it was, it was great. So that does, you know, back up your view. However, a lot of people want a choice. A lot of people do not want their child to be strictly in a um, environment where they have to monitor that, that child constantly. They, ha they may have teenagers that they do not want to be at home all day long, that they want them to be engaged in school at least part of the day. And so I believe it's not that you have, to, you have to say one thing is good and one thing is bad or one thing is even better. It's just, it's an option, it's a choice. And should we give people a choice if a choice is possible to give them? So um, that I think um, is, I think we have to move forward now. I think that um, we need to, uh, it sounds to me like um, we pretty much hashed this one through. I know it's it's a controversial thing. I know there's very strong feelings. Um, and, uh, you know, <laughs> having been a teacher, having a daughter who's a teacher who's currently working, I understand the concerns of going in a classroom and facing possible risks. But I think what you also have to realize is that um, we are gearing this up according to risk and we will back off if the risk increases and so people's fears that uh, you know this is an absolute this is what's going to happen it may not happen it's just we need to be prepared with something we need to plan for what could possibly happen we can't leave it hanging teachers need to be lined up Logistics need to, 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 uh, to be made. It, it has to start and we have to have something, some skeleton on which to put some flesh. So I'm asking you now if, um, if we're ready to, to make a decision on this so that we can um, move forward. Yes. I would like to move option one for elementary and option three for secondary. And I thought you stated the situation very well. Okay, that was if you didn't um, if you didn't know it was AM AM PM for both elementary and secondary. Yeah. Okay, so I have a motion by Dr. Kaiser. I have a second by Eileen Robinson, um, and the question is whether to endorse having the AM PM instructional model if we move forward on with this uh, when school starts and we're capable of moving, moving forward. Are we ready? Okay, I'm gonna take a um, roll call vote on this. Okay, Eileen? Robinson, aye. Kaiser? Aye. Griffin, aye. 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 Lando, nay. Okay, we have a four to one split, uh, but the um, motion passes. Okay, so now what we're going to move on talking about is uh, what sort of professional development is going to occur in order to ensure that uh, this can move forward and that everybody is going to be able to move backward or forward in case situation does change. So Mr. Shepard and Mr. Sullivan have been working on staff development plans both for the summer and for the back to school staff development day. So um, Mr. Shepard, would you like to kick us off here? Sure, just, just looking at the first bullet there that we began training additional teachers on edgenuity, not knowing if we were going to be moved back to stage one. And that was the major premise behind starting to train teachers, not about on a vote or where we we're gonna go with things tonight, but back in, in May and June, we didn't know 
where we were going to be if we were still going to be in stage one. So we realized we needed a much more consistent platform for online learning. So we started training teachers there. We did pilot it with some teachers over the summer in summer school. Uh, we had 10 teachers trained then. And I'll let Mr. Sullivan talk about some of the next bullets. From, from the elementary perspective, we have a couple of dates already set up, August 5th and 6th, with a pretty extensive overview of the curriculum we purchased. We have representatives from those companies ready to come in and provide a couple hours for each one of those. We have a couple of teachers that have done a bang up job with online instruction in the past, ready to kind of provide another few hours of kind of best practices and how that looks and how that weaves into with the curriculum we've got. So we've got those two dates planned. Um, so it'll be about six, seven hours per day there with training for teachers. And we also have the August 13th is our first kind of professional development day back. We've already started planning as far as what we want to put in place so that teachers, all teachers, but certainly teachers are going to do the online instruction, have another round of overview with curriculum planning and how to have things ready for that first day of school when it starts like there. We've also talked about what staff meeting time would look like for those teachers in the online um, version of things. And we've already said, really, staff meeting is really going to be professional development meeting time, is what it's going to be, more than staff meeting kinds of things. So we have some teachers that uh, once again going have a good background with that, and they've kind of agreed that that's what they would like to be part of dealing with us. I think in our staff room, we've actually kind of coalesced a whole bunch of online resources. Also, if you look in our staff, or staff room for teachers, they will see that there's a whole slew of online resources, um, training modules, training videos, and things like that, ready to go as well as a curriculum with kind of a scope and sequence with all those things laid out. So we think we're off to a good start. We certainly would like more time to plan and provide professional development, but we're feeling we're, we're off to a decent start right now. And, and I know it's been, um, you know, the, the board has made clear that we want to be sure that uh, all the teachers have some familiarity with uh, edgenuity and wonders and uh, the math for iReady because should we need to rather quickly switch over to um, independent study, you know, we don't, we don't want anybody to be floundering. And, uh, and so that, you know, I think that has been conveyed loud and clear. And I know you are constricted in some ways by how much you can require. And so um, I know you're working to, to, to make that happen and to encourage teachers so that uh, they will be prepared and they'll feel capable of, of taking yeah, we, that on. We have planned for that August 13th that all teachers, whether they're on, online or not, they will also get a couple hour overview of the curriculum and some of the practices. So just in case something were to happen where we had to shift back to stage one, everybody would at least have a, a workable level to kind of start providing that online program and experience at that point also. Right, and should that happen, I'm sure we will provide more support and more instruction. Okay, um, so moving on now, are we? Um, we'll go ahead and click. Any? Did we want to talk about anything else relative to this? Uh, Superintendent. Superintendent. Staley, did you want to go over the Butte County? So I, I did mention this earlier, and I do apologize. My computer died. Um, we have worked with Butte County Public Health, and um, do have some a, a flow chart of how we will handle situations as they come forward. I also want to say thank you for making a decision. I know that there are viewpoints all over the board, and um, there was no way we were going to make one decision that made everyone happy and met everyone's needs. But I do appreciate the fact that we have options so that parents and families can choose those options that are best for them. I also want to really thank um, our teachers, our support staff, and our community because um, just trying to get my through my emails every single day <laughs> has been a challenge, but that's what we wanted. That's what we asked for. We asked you to reach out. We asked you to give input, and um, I can say I read them all. I know that board members read them all, as and most board members, if not all, read them all. So uh, we really do appreciate the input, and I know you may not feel like what you said or what you wanted was heard because it may not have ended up that way, but again, I, I, I think that we at least have options in place. We still have a ton of work to do, and we knew that going in. We knew we were going to have a lack of specificity until we had a model in place. So now that we have a model in place, we can be begin working on the staffing. We can begin uh, meeting family needs. We can begin working with our staff and our teachers to make sure that to the best of our ability, we get them in situations that um, they desire and are comfortable. 
So uh, I wish I could say, whew, decision made, this is over. No, this is when the real hard work, work for us begins. So um, unless there are other questions, we do have up here a sample um, of the flow chart. We have been asked by uh, Butte County Public Health to not distribute this at this point. They are working on one that um, will be for community distributions for parents and families and other community members to see. So we look forward to seeing that sooner rather than later. We have told them there, is, there are lots of questions, um, a lot of anxiety surrounding this. So uh, we look forward to having the public version of what happens when, who does what, um, that we can share. Ms. Robinson, I think you had your hand. Uh, not on this issue, um, uh, Ms. Daly, that, that was uh, shared um, last week and, and uh, it, it was comforting to know that they too are you know, looking forward to what to do if. So this is a, a, good, a good outline of what to do if. I have something else next. Yeah, I will say they have been good partners. They've been very responsive. Uh, when we have questions and needs, they get back to us. So I do feel really good about that working relationship with our health department. So with that, unless there are other questions I can answer. Um, yes, Eileen. No, it, it, are you ready to go away from that? Uh, I, I, yeah, I mean. I uh, just, it's, it's very, very quick. I just sure. wanted to um, address the public that's been watching and texting and um, Mr. Shepard can probably attest to this. There are lots of comments. Yes, there are. And I just want everybody to know that the, the feed ha uh, is, you know, it, it comes to us. I've been reading through them um, off and on. And the questions like, what do we do if we have kids at different schools? Um, how can we schedule? All of those things are on our list. Um, community members give the district the rest of this week to kind of begin to, to outline those things because by next week those kinds of options and things are going to be outlined for you. Check the CUSD website, the uh, announcements and things will be there so that we can do exactly what we intended to do here tonight which is outline options and give parents enough information so that they can make choices that, you know, that they can support for their kids for this next year until everything changes. <laughs> okay. Yes, last slide we have for you. And again, I want to thank you again for all your guys' hard work on this and the, the teachers, as Ms. Staley talked about, and our ed services team and the unions working together getting to this process. I know it's not an easy one and it's, a new experience for all of us that we've had to get to get here. All right, so the next step, so Monday, July 20th, um, communicate reopening of a school model and conditions with our um, Chico Unified families and staff. We will have um, available for families to register for instructional models. So we're gonna want the families to, when they do that, choose if they're going to be going to our Oak Bridge model or the AMPM model. Um, on there also too, we will have something where they could suggest if they're going with the AM, PM, uh, if they want AM, PM, and how many students that they have on those. Um, we were just reading through the chat. One of the families said, I, I might have want to pick different ones because my older child can drive and give the, drive the AM one in the morning and they can go to the PM. So we're going to want them to let us know what they're thinking on that so we can kind of best meet their needs. Um, planning for staffing adjustment begins. Um, Mr. Hanlon and um, our Ed Services team and, um, and working with the union, um, getting that all taken care of. Um, we got a, a puzzle piece to, puzzle to put together when it comes to our staffing and how many families choose online versus the AMPM model. Fine tune each instructional model and begin implementing safety guidelines. Um, the safety guidelines, um, our maintenance and operations staff, along with Mr. Boltman's group, have done an excellent job of um, getting that prepared. Uh, we're getting how many of the portable stations we'll need for in coming into our campuses for, uh, for wellness checks and for hand sanitizing. We will continue to work with them with maintenance and operation now that they know what model that we're going to be starting out. And remember, the models could change at any time because it depends on the stages. So we're, we're going to be continuing to be working on all that. 
and initiate the professional development for all of our staff. We're going to want, no matter what, all of our staff trained in um, the secondary teachers trained in ingenuity, our elementary changed in the toolbox and wonders. We want them all just in case um, if the state does put us back in stage one. But we're also going to have to talk to now because they're going to be seeing teaching a lesson twice basically at the elementary level at the AM, PM, and how did that look like when their day just got cut in half with the students. They'll have, yes, they'll have less students, but they still have to be able to um, uh, regulate how they're going to be teaching that, and we're going to be, have to be, get some professional development out that, and we will have to do the same with the secondary. And so we're going to be, we have some uh, meetings set up with our district um, uh, leadership council, our DLC group, to work with us and how that professional development would help support their teachers going forward. So finally, I just want to say, again, we do have work cut out for us. This will not be perfect. It's not perfect any year when we come back. There are kinks that have to be worked out. There's things that um, aren't thought of and that we have to address. That is um, going to happen anytime you're going to a new model. And frankly, it happens every single year. So uh, this year is going to be ultra challenging, but we have great people. We have wonderful students, wonderful support staff, staff. We will make it happen for our kids. So. Thank you for your time tonight, and that's all I have on this particular topic. Okay, well, we have one last item on our agenda, but before we get to that one last item, I want to thank everybody here and everybody out there in uh, the viewing public who has participated and shared your views and those people who also have emailed. Um, as Kelly mentioned before, the fact that what we came up with may not have uh, you know, been exactly what you were looking for does not mean that we did not listen or consider it. We had such a variety and multitude of many, many considerations and um, we needed to start somewhere. So we will be ironing things out and addressing a lot of those questions as time goes on. So thank, thank you everybody, everybody who's here has worked so hard. Um, so we're going to address our last item, and that is a board policy that has to do with student wellness. And uh, is there any discussion? Yes, Dr. Kaiser. I uh, actually want to suggest, if it's feasible to do it now or if we have to wait, I want to suggest an amendment on page 4 to the number 1230. Can you find that? Page four, number 1230. Um, this says that any school provided to K-12 students during school hours and from midnight to one half hour after school shall not contain or, you know, it's talking about the negatives. Uh, I would like to insert the language, any school provided to K-12 students by the district because I don't think at midnight you're going to be in my house uh, monitoring what my kids get served. And the way this is written, it doesn't make any sense to me. Okay, let, let's, let's go to where that is it's, on there. It's, it's under the nutritions. You got it? Not yet. Yet. Very last thing about nutrition. So you're on page three. You want to go to page four. Okay, and go down to the bottom. Okay, what? right there. See that? Any food provided to K-12 students from midnight to one half hour after school. We're only in charge of what we provide. And that language doesn't say that, so that's the insert I would like to see. So you would like it to read any any food provided to K-12 students by, by the, district. the district during school hours. Okay. Okay. Does anyone have any objection to that insertion? No, I'm no, I'm surprised that it isn't clear that that's what's meant because I, I worked for several years on um, this uh, policy. And, and I know that that's the intent, so if you can make it clearer by adding those words, I support it. Okay, so is, um, is, um, is that clear to um, Erica? Okay, you got that, all right. Um, Kelly? Just, just to clarify, this is ed code, 
So to clarify it, we will need to put it in parentheses. Okay. But, okay. Um, that will be, I think I mean, that's... Clearly, we can't change ed code, but we sure. do know what the meaning is. Okay. Yeah, I think putting it in parentheses is fine, um, so long as it's just, uh, yeah. you know, to clarification. Um, okay, so do I have a motion then to pass this? So move. Okay, motion by Dr. Kaiser, second by Eileen Robinson. Um, I, th I guess we had a roll call vote before, so I think we have to do one again. Oh. Um, okay. Eileen? Kaiser, aye. Griffin, aye. All righty, that passes unanimously. Uh, since we are not live, um, we're going to not do the items from the floor. Any further announcements? Okay, seeing none, I will adjourn this meeting. Thank you all very much for being here. Yeah, you guys worked incredibly hard. Thank you.